Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19 of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. Um, we welcome the ministers and departments of Transport and Public Works as well as Human Settlements. Um, before we get into the meat of the meeting, I'd like to check um, if there are any apologies. I have received none. No apologies. Um, then I'd like to just ascertain whether there are any registered alternates uh, standing in today uh, that are representing other members. Okay, none. Um, all right, then um, just to uh, please inform you of the rules of engagement for our virtual meetings. All members have been muted uh, at the start of this meeting to avoid background noises. Um, members should please flag any points of order by either using the chat function or the newly instituted raise your hand button and um, they will then be recognized. All audio and video should please be switched off to improve the quality uh, of the connection. However, if a member, a minister, um, an HOD or official is speaking, uh, please do put on your microphone and video. And we ask that departments share their presentations on the Microsoft Teams platform while they are busy presenting. Um, and we ask that other participants switch off uh, their mics. Um, and also then that once the presentation is concluded, if uh, you could please stop sharing and also then switch off your microphone. That just helps um, us for maintaining order in the course of the meeting. My name is Mireille Wenger and I'm the chairperson of this ad hoc committee. And today we welcome Minister Madikizela, as well as Minister Simmers, um, as well as the head of Department of Public Works, Ms. Jackie Gooch and the Head of Department of Human Settle Settlements, Ms. Jacqueline Sampson. So very warm welcome to you all. Um, I'm going to structure the meeting as follows. We're going to have both presentations, one after the other. First, we will start with transport and uh, public infrastructure of 30 minutes, followed directly by the Department of Human Settlements for 30 minutes. I would ask please that the departments do stick to the time uh, strictly. Um, so that would then allow us to have two hours of uh, questions and answers to those two departments. So on that note, then um, I'll start with you, Minister Madikizela. Welcome. If you'd like to make some introductory remarks and introduce your team and then jump straight into the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. We, without further ado, I, um, I will hand over straight to the HOD to do the presentation and I will deal with questions. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, Minister, much appreciated. I have with me today a few members of my team as well in support. Uh, Advocate Chantal Smith, our Chief Financial Officer. Uh, Mrs. DJ Ribbonar, responsible for transport operations. Advocate Carl Reinecke, who's the DDG for transport management. Uh, Mr. Gerrit van Skalkweg, who is the acting head of strategy and planning. And then also Mr. Farrell Payne, who is the director responsible for traffic law enforcement. I will just uh, share my screen with you now in terms of the presentation. I uh, if I may ask, uh, Chairperson, can everybody see the presentation? Yes, clearly. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the presentation was sent through to you. It is uh, relatively long. I will stick within the 30 minutes because there are a lot of uh, photographs that I will skip through relatively quickly. I'll not necessarily speak to every point. Um, but then just to start, that as the committee, you asked us to focus on a number of aspects. The first one was around the traffic officer and road user safety to prevent infection from the virus, looking at the adherence to safety measures by operators, and then looking also at the sanitizing of ranks, the frequency thereof. 
In the infrastructure space, the committee asked for some information around the quarantine and isolation sites, as well as in the work that we've been doing uh, linked to the industry and the construction industry, the impact COVID-19 has had on our infrastructure projects, including obviously just at the back end of the last financial year. Then you asked a question about unspent transfers or subsidies. And then I have also added at the end a slide just around the risks given the particular context uh, for the department. So it's important to understand obviously the context that we are all finding ourselves in as far as COVID is concerned, requiring the department to be quite agile, uh, be innovative in terms of its responses and understand uh, how we deal with potentially new uh, experiences and new approaches. So the transport side of things, I'm going to take the two areas that the committee had asked for. The first one is around the provincial traffic response, and then the next one is on the public transport side. Within the provincial traffic response, the team, of course, needed to ensure that we were able to adjust our normal operational mandates, the directives and our deployment when the nationwide lockdown was announced by the president. Obviously, we are clustered under the Emergency Personnel and Security Services, so our work then uh, ultimately was done with the South African Police Services and other law enforcement agencies. The department needed to make sure that we were able to provide the necessary PPE, personal protective equipment, in line with the health and safety requirements uh, to our staff, and that then took a little bit of time and we were were able to deploy that for our traffic officers so that they could render uh, their particular functions. I'd also like to note that we did also assist with providing PPE to some of the local traffic authorities that we had available uh, to be able to support them in their duties, as well as in helping to distribute PPE that was received from the Road Traffic Management Corporation uh, through to the various local authorities. We obviously had to compile all the different directives for the team in terms of their work and make sure that they were performing their duties in a safe manner. We did, uh, when COVID uh, was announced and the, the, the statements that were required to make sure that our teams would get safe, we did suspend the roadside breath testing process as well as the mobile evidentiary alcohol uh, testing uh, processes. However, if any person stopped on our roads was suspected of being over the legal limit, they were then taken and are taken through to the nearest hospital, hospital to have their blood drawn. We also suspended the use of the way bridges um, at the start of the lockdown period and fundamentally then used our way bridges as strategic vehicle checkpoints. We have started to re and reopen them um, as of about a week ago uh, to be able to come in line with the increased traffic that we're experiencing with the change in alert level. Vehicles are sanitized uh, in terms of a particular protocol to make sure then that our, our officers are kept as safe as possible uh, at the end of their shift. The duty rosters meant that they, um, instead of working the eight hour shifts, we shifted, we changed that to 12 hours and we adjusted the normal buddy system, which is normally two officers per vehicle, to actually have two vehicles in close proximity with a single officer per vehicle. And that also then meant that uh, we reduced the potential risk uh, from an infection perspective and the concept of social distancing as well uh, within the provincial traffic team. We uh, continued to utilize our technology to promote social distancing so people are able to book on or off with their duties. And then in terms of our resources, they were deployed to the major interprovincial roadblocks, the fixed roadblocks, as well as the vehicle checkpoints in support of SAP as well as the SANDF. Notwithstanding those particular roadblocks and the VCPs, um, our officers are still deployed to maintain active and visible patrols and obviously respond as and when required um, in terms of traffic and transport matters. Moving on to the public transport response, the province uh, created a transport planning and coordination committee, uh, which is a joint initiative between our department and the city of Cape Town, meeting every second day and allowing us then through its location at the disaster management center to be able to respond to matters in relation to public transport on a live basis. We were able to get the necessary reports produced, uh, deal with particular issues, identify trends, and then also make sure that the necessary feedback was provided to the national government uh, as we have to do on a daily basis. The committee implemented daily monitoring of the public transport operations at interchanges in collaboration with the city. They had um, a team 
that could be deployed to be able to actually see on the ground what was happening at the various interchanges. And we also then on the 27th of April launched a USSD app that allowed the passengers to provide feedback to us. And I'll speak to that in a little bit more detail in the, in the following slides. We were also through video surveillance. And so there's camera networks that the city have and others that we were able to link up through the disaster management center. And our team present there are able to do live monitoring of what's happening at the various ranks in terms of operations. And then where issues were identified, be able to engage with the main bus taxi industry, other operators like Golden Arrow, um, to be able to improve on how they were performing in line with the requirements and the regulation. So in terms of compliance monitoring, we developed also an app that the monitors on the ground when they went to interchanges could, could capture the necessary issues. Uh, through that and the graphics there, just to try and give you a sense of what the interface looked like. It focused on sanitization, on whether there was um, compliance to vehicle capacity restrictions. At the time, under level five, it was also about the operating hours uh, in terms of just being able to operate in the morning and the afternoon. And then other aspects now are being brought in in terms of the requirements of wearing masks and by the drivers, but also the passengers. All that information filtered through on a daily basis in terms of a, a live um, dashboard for the team to be able to monitor, analyze, and then react and respond to issues as they were raised. The following graphics are just some pictures so you can get a sense of the type of data that we were able to see, both in terms of vehicle counts uh, that are recorded, trends in the types of issues that were being raised, and then when a particular intervention occurred, did we see any sort of downward trend um, in terms of the appropriate response from the public um, and the operators concerned? We also, for example, on the 22nd of April, were able to get a sense um, which ranks were problematic and which ones then we needed to respond to and engage with the industry. In terms of questions from the committee, you asked about social distancing and others. The city of Cape Town has been going through a process of painting the necessary lines and markings, and I'll just run through some graphics on that um, at a number of their interchanges. We've received um, and supported the receiving of donations to the minibus taxi industry for PPE. Um, and I'll give a little bit of detail on that one in a moment. Obviously, the number of passengers when alert level four came about has dramatically increased compared to what we saw under lockdown level five. But there are still some areas that are recurring uh, non-compliance, and we are trying to address those through the committee and the engagements with the industries. The following slides are from the City of Cape Town team, just to give you a sense um, intergovernmentally what the city are doing. They're going out with loud hailing at public transport facilities, trying to make sure that people are aware of the requirements about social distancing and, and not congregating too closely. This slide is just to give you a sense of a schedule that they're following the various interchanges, um, but I think it's very important that we make sure that the message gets through in terms of concepts about behavior change. The next ones are pictures around the physical demarcations. These are at the My City stations um, that are operating, and you see then the marks on the floors that have been put, put out, even then what's being painted at the minibus taxi ranks um, through the city. Now, I mentioned a little earlier that we've put in place a USSD process where passengers are able to give us feedback directly on their experiences on various public transport. And we ask them then to respond to aspects about the vehicle capacity, whether the driver is wearing a mask, whether there's hand sanitizer available, and what the general cleanliness is of the vehicle. We've uh, tried to communicate that as broadly as possible, and this is just an example of that in terms of the kind of posters, social media promotions, etc. And then we gather this type of information on a daily basis: how many responses we've had, what the sort of issues are. Um, so that then the team are able to direct uh, their interventions accordingly. Within the public transport space, obviously communication is vital. And so we've been using various channels to communicate. There's been different media releases. As we know, Minister Medikizela has been to various taxi ranks, uh, engaging with commuters, engaging with the industry themselves, providing promotional material, including flyers and posters. Even prior to lockdown, uh, TPW supported and provided posters to Metro Rail, to Golden Arrow as 
as um, health information, what people should do using public transport and others, then also using social media. And then also the city has supported with providing a numbers of posters as well to some taco, uh, also through to the minibus taxi industry. We've used PA systems at public transport interchanges and also even prior to lockdown, there was a short message that was uh, provided through to Prasa to run through the stations at their platforms to remind people about uh, social distancing, the hygiene, et cetera. And then there's a number of moving billboards that we are going that we have uh, put in place to be able to also make sure that we constantly get the message um, through to through to our communities. These are then just some of the some graphics around uh, what measures should be taken in terms of public transport, how many passengers should you have in a vehicle, and then an example um, in terms of what was produced from the city uh, team to the minibus taxi specifically. Obviously, there are restrictions as far as the capacity um, aspects are concerned. We work closely with bus operators, particularly Golden Arrow and the Go George team, to make sure that they comply uh, with the capacity restrictions. We've produced frequently asked question documents uh, and provided that, and then also put in place the necessary monitoring processes, and have even supported the law enforcement officials at various roadblocks um, so that they have a checklist of what they need to look at uh, when dealing with public transport. On the hygiene side of things, um, Golden Arrow specifically uh, ensure that their vehicles are sanitized. They have a, a specific process that they do follow. The My City buses are regularly sanitized. Then the city is going through a process of deep cleaning and sanitization at their operational PTIs. And I've got a, a couple of pictures and stuff on that in a moment or two. And certainly Golden Arrow have also instituted temperature testing of all their staff on entry and exit of all their operational depots. So the following are then just some graphics in terms of sanitization and cleaning processes. This is through the My City uh, buses that, that the city has got, the My City facilities that they have. And then the next one is a schedule uh, of their cleaning program across a number of the PTIs. You'll see here then um, some of the pictures of the public transport interchanges with the city team hard at work, as well as then decontaminating uh, of a number of their facilities clearly uh, at the end of the day uh, in terms of, of the operations of public transport. We have also assisted uh, various operators with procurement and the distribution of sanitizer and PPE, uh, including then also distributing items to Santaco, sourced by both the depa our department as well as the National Department of Transport. In terms of the donations that have been received, a number of them have come through um, the, the department or have been um, assisted in terms of the distribution model. And thus far, these are the three specific donations. Obviously, in addition to the stuff that the uh, RTMC has provided to local authorities, that um, the National Department of Transport has provided through to the taxi industry, that you get a sense of some of the donations to PPE, particularly to the minibus taxi team. On the Go George side of things, uh, we clearly work with the George municipality as in terms of the Go George uh, operator. And then I've already mentioned the work that they undertake uh, in terms of the cleaning and the processes. They also make sure actually that their buses also operate at the maximum of their 50% capacity. The next couple of slides, uh, Chair, I'm going to just skip through. They were provided and you would then have them electronically just for some background around the regulatory aspects of the public transport environment. I'm not going to speak to those specifically. If I now move on to the quarantine and isolation facilities and then your, uh, the aspects around infrastructure. So just to pick up on a couple of points on the quarantine and isolation um, approach and, and response that's necessary. The first one is understanding the WHO trans transmission categories or scenarios and understanding then uh, that each one of those requires a different a response uh, from the um, public health system and particularly within where quarantine and isolation from a WHO point of view is fundamentally used within the suppression stages. Now, I don't have to explain to you the concepts of flattening the curve, um, but from within the quarantine and isolation concepts, obviously the quarantine intent is to be able to provide a space or quarantine somebody who may have been exposed 
to someone who is COVID positive uh, so that they then uh, they can be monitored. And then isolation, obviously, is to separate somebody who is sick or so somebody who has tested positive from those who are not. Now, Q&I, the efficacy of quarantine and isolation, obviously, is a core part of that process of flattening the curve. Certainly, one of the things that impacts on it is the testing process, the, the time uh, in terms of turnaround time of the testing results. Um, and therefore, obviously, understanding the rate of infection, being able to identify uh, relatively quickly people who are COVID positive and then their contacts to be able to have, make sure that they are quarantined or isolated. Obviously, for us, it's important that our strategy is one that provides for quarantine and isolation facilities from a government point of view, understanding the socioeconomic environment that we have within South Africa compared to obviously other places around the world that have dealt with COVID or are and are still dealing with it. There are facility requirements. So the National Department of Health did provide some guidelines which have been looked at and then worked to be context specific within the Western Cape by the Western Cape Department of Health. And we're using those um, to help to guide us in terms of the facilities that need to be provided. Clearly, it's important to understand that from a quarantine point of view, that's where individual rooms are necessary because you could have, while people are in quarantine, you might actually have somebody who has not yet displayed symptoms, um, but who may then very well be positive right next to somebody who actually isn't at all. Um, so it is important that we understand the different infrastructure requirements between the two. From a cost point of view and an approach, the department worked first to try to utilize turnkey hospitality facilities as a first step to be able to give us some time uh, to move to other facilities. Understanding that on a turnkey basis, there are no setup costs, obviously, but the running cost is um, higher than from a government point of view in terms of owned accommodation. But it is also important to acknowledge that there is a, a potential positive to a very vulnerable industry at the moment, understanding that within particularly the Western Cape context, um, our tourism industry is a core part of, of our economy. And so by using a few of the hospitality facilities, that certainly did mean that there was at least some money going into that, that system. Clearly, um, then we would, we're moving on to government-owned facilities with minimal setup costs, such as some of the results and so on. Then you would look at uh, government facilities that do require more fit out, potentially halls and others that may not have the type of ablution facilities that are necessary um, or the kind of rooms that are required. And then should it be necessary from a numbers point of view to ultimately move to something fundamentally um, larger in terms of major, requiring major fit out or response. We have already secured a few of the privately owned hospitality uh, facilities, and those were then used for the immediate needs in terms of placement. And then we've moved on to the government facilities um, in terms of that needed a few, a little bit more of lead time. We are using two private facilities that have been provided um, at no cost to government in terms of fit out costs. I had to note there are obviously Petro SA and then specifically Old Mutual. Um, that have undertaken the necessary fit out costs and so on and being provided uh, free of charge and would just require uh, running costs to be paid for uh, by government. Obviously, quarantine and isolation strategy has to evolve just as the health strategy is evolving. Uh, we can't have started with a particular view at the beginning of, of, our, of the disaster in South Africa and the Western Cape and end with the same view. It does have to evolve over time and respond to it in terms of the kind of approach. And certainly, therefore, the linear type of strategy is one that cannot be implemented. We have to understand its intent around slowing the spread, responding and supporting the most vulnerable uh, in our community, protecting them and limiting, obviously, the spread of the infection in other areas. The principles of the q and I am not going to go through, Chair. They are covered there. Um, fundamentally about few facilities, particularly in the rural areas, to cover a larger area and looking at the transport response which we have in place, um, which Minister Mitikizela launched uh, a couple of days ago in terms of the red dot process. Graphically, I've tried to give you a sense if we were to take a 100 kilometer radius, particularly in certain areas, what, what area is covered. Understanding that we bring facilities online as and when required. So 
as infections pick up in a particular area, we've got lists of facilities and then they are brought in st on stream to be able to respond. We don't want to be paying for things before it is necessary to do so. The next graphic is just to give you a sense in terms of then the kind of where the crowding in, of course, of our coverage is from a capacity point of view, what sort of bed numbers will be available. Um, we have out of those three and a half thousand, there are a few that are being activated at this point to bring us to the three and a half thousand uh, number. In general, uh, to give you a sense about the cost of Q&I, the turnkey or private facilities are in the region of about a thousand rand per bed per night, whereas in terms of the government owned facilities, you're looking at about 400 rand per bed per night. Remembering, of course, that the private facility is ultimately catering for including the cost of their property rates, etc. Whereas within the government calculation, property rates are paid for in a different line item, a different budget item. So we're not necessarily comparing apples with apples. And I use property rates just as one example in terms of the costing. And then to give you a sense of the sort of numbers that we have available between now, obviously, and also the end of July. An appropriate transport response, the red dot has been um, launched and that will be used to augment the Department of Health's capacity. If I move, may move on to the construction industry aspects, um, I don't need to, to tell this committee how important, obviously, the construction industry is to our country and to the West of Cape uh, as an employer and the number of people uh, that can be kept employed. And we do know that even prior to COVID, this is a particular sector of our, of our economy that really has been battling. To give you a sense of the communication uh, with the various contractors, these are just four items. I, I didn't want to list all of the details, but we have kept in contact. We've sent notices, letters, uh, and details and responded when, when necessary and trying to keep um, our contractors, consultants, and the various service providers informed of what's required, how we need to respond, and others. Clearly for us now, on alert level four, it means that projects can start to, to return, and uh, that is what has been done now. We've been assessing the various sites, the various projects, um, in terms of both the public work side of things, as well as the roads teams, so that they're able to get back to work. And my understanding is that a few are, are still on their way, but certainly for our road side and for the bulk of our general infrastructure um, and other projects, they're already all back uh, on site and people uh, are working. Then just to give you a sense of some of the qualifying criteria clearly, um, because the construction industry, even working for, for us under load level four, does need to comply with the health, health and safety requirements. They have to make sure that they have undertaken the necessary assessments look at how they can limit the number of people on the site or even within an office environment from a professional service provider perspective. Uh, so that has to apply to both the um, construction as well as the professional services team. And then the sites needs to be, need to be properly managed to ensure that they adhere to the, to the requirements. We have obviously done an assessment in terms of the degrees of risk and understanding um, also based upon information coming from the construction industry, that different parts of their work have got lower risk, obviously other parts. So where sites are large, for example, on the construction stage, there's far lower risk uh, from a, a COVID perspective, potentially in terms of their teams being more distributed and higher risk parts of the construction environment will be the scaffolding. Uh, when people are being transported, they have to make sure that they adhere to the social distancing requirements, the capacity requirements, et cetera. And then also aspects like canteens, showers, the toys, the confined spaces that are obviously higher risk and require an appropriate response from the contract to manage. Then I thought I would give you a snapshot um, of the current projects, the infrastructure construction projects that we had identified uh, that can now and are returning to work under this lockdown level four to give you a sense of the numbers of projects, obviously the value of the works that were in construction and then the estimate uh, in terms of the number of people that the estimate would be getting back to work, uh, which is obviously very important for us. There are contracts that are pending that should be awarded and obviously projects as well in the pipeline that need to be going out uh, to tender uh, in order to make sure that we keep the work going out uh, to the private sector. The committee then chair asked for some an understanding about some of the impacts and I thought it would be useful to give you a snapshot of a couple of the health side of things. Certainly at the end of the 1920 financial year, two particular areas to focus on for the committee that were impacted by COVID 
um, not because of COVID within South Africa, but because of it obviously being in China. The lift program for various health facilities was impacted particularly because the equipment was manufactured in China and then obviously couldn't be dispatched because they were under lockdown. And by the time then that potentially lockdown is ended and the, the lift can be dispatched, by the time you get here, then South Africa is potentially under lockdown. So there are some projects there, as well as then the generator panel upgrade from a Tigerberg Hospital point view that was also impacted. A number of projects in terms of planning and tender, and fundamentally, Chair, because the team and absolutely understood from the Department of Health side are focused on responding to the pandemic and the infrastructure that's required for that. So these projects are on hold at the moment, um, pending us trying to make sure is there another way for us to be able to get some of these things moving in partnership with the Department of Health. We did have 44 projects that were in construction from the health side at the start of lockdown. Five of them continued, um, but obviously the majority were shut down in terms of the regulations. And there is a potential impact, obviously, in terms of the time side of things, uh, impact around PPE, because contractors are obviously going to have to ensure that their staff have got the necessary PPE. Um, and that, in turn, that cost will obviously be carried across through to the client. On the Conradi Park side of things, I thought I would just give you a sense here that this one also was impacted in terms of lockdown. Obviously, from a, a spend point of view, in terms of the, um, the grants, and then the construction works in terms of the civil side of things have been delayed and obviously they've also got back to site now under lockdown level four, making sure that they are able to comply with all the necessary requirements from a health and safety uh, perspective. Chair, um, coming towards the end of the presentation, your question about unspent transfers and subsidies. Within our department at the end of the financial year, we only had a total unspent transfer amount of 2.271 million. Uh, that obviously we will be dealt with in, within the necessary rules from a treasury perspective. Uh, we would like to ask for those funds to be uh, reallocated to the department uh, for us to offset some expenditure on PPE, but obviously our expenditure is way more than, than 2.27 million as a department, uh, understanding our required response to traffic, our traffic teams and others. So in terms of our risks, um, obviously, for our, for our staff, especially given the nature of provincial traffic's work coming into contact with other law enforcement teams, we do have to keep um, an eye on them in terms of quarantine and isolation requirements. And potentially, if infection rates uh, increase, that would constrain out our department's ability to respond. There are risks from a contractual perspective, the constant regulatory changes, and then obviously from a budget implication point of view, the potential reductions that the entire province is going to have may certainly impact um, on us. We're not yet uh, certain that is obviously still all work in progress. So Chair, if I may, in conclusion, um, for us, obviously, COVID has had a devastating impact on, on the most vulnerable of our society. Also, obviously, on the systems of our governance. Um, and as a department, we obviously need to be agile we need to be able to respond to that. We have made every effort to make sure that we're able to support our frontline staff as a department, particularly um, our traffic teams, the transport operations teams, um, and then moving through into the process of enabling the economic activity to be gradually opened up uh, so that we can execute our mandate and do our part to build resilience, uh, to create the opportunities that are necessary, and then ultimately to maximize service delivery. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gooch, and you've kept perfectly within the time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to you and your department, as well as the minister, for having um, put together um, that uh, a very uh, informative presentation. Um, if I could then ask uh, Minister Simmers um, if we could move on to human settlements, please, if you'd like to make some introductory remarks. Welcome, Minister. Uh, and then move straight into the presentation. Um, and if you'd indicate whether you or your HOD will be will be doing the presentation, thank you. No, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much to the members of the ad hoc committee for uh, affording my department this opportunity. And I'll be very short and brief in my opening remarks to set the tone for my HOD, who will ultimately do the presentation on my department's behalf, um, Madam Chair. Firstly, if we take a look at the current situation, the revol uh, revolving around COVID-19, it clearly shows that all three spheres of government sadly have a reactionary 
uh, approach to the situation in, in dealing with the current situation and with real needs of our community, Madam Chair and Madam Chair. But from our uh, departmental perspective, uh, what we will present to, to, to the Adoc Committee is, is our proposed current and also planned future programs that seeks to give a proactive solution in really what is unusual situations and circumstances which as a province but ultimately as a government we find ourselves in as well. And through this we seek to address the realities of firstly our ever-growing densely populated informal settlements but also something that is unique to the Western Cape and Gauteng province also the growing backyard communities in areas like in our province Mitchell's Plain, Retreat and all these other areas ma'am. Uh, so for us, it's a growing concern within these co communities, which is ultimately now also part of the, the hotspot areas, is a growing number of those who do not qualify uh, in terms of our gu guidelines uh, that we receive from the National Department uh, in these areas, which are becoming a major factor moving forward to ensure that our programs that we roll out are a success. And this will be a reality that will remain unless we don't deal with it in the metro, but also in our non-metro area. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my HOD. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Sampson. Good afternoon, members. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson and members. Jackie Sampson here from um, the Department of Human Settlements. I uh, just want to check, uh, must I share the presentation or will... Yes, please. Sure. Thank you. Can you see the presentation? We can, thank you. Thank you. So I'll go ahead. We were requested by the committee to do a presentation on the prohibition of evictions during lockdown and what we as a Department of Human Settlements are doing to ensure compliance. What measures are in place for those individuals who reside in congested housing structures that test positively and how we deal with those some cases. The information on the re-blocking of our priority areas and to combat the spread of COVID-19 and then um, how we partnered with private or other government departments on um, water supply and water provision and also addressing sanitization in um, public spaces. Thank you. So we'll cover those um, aspects as requested by the committee. By way of introduction, when the president declared the disaster on 15 March and declared it a pandemic, we also um, were we also received directives from the National Department of Human Settlements on how we deal with congested areas. Subsequent to that, 29 informal settlements nationally were identified as highly congested areas. And those are areas with more than 1,000 households and more than 100 dwelling units per hectare. So it's a number of households and the density in those households. But in the Western Cape, there were three such um, settlements identified, being the Noon in the Milneton area, Kosovo in Philippi, and Kailicha. So I'll talk to the detail of that later on. First, I'll address the evictions and the process on how we deal with um, pro, um, invasions and evictions. In terms of 20, Section 26 of the Constitution, no one may be evicted from the home or have the home demolished without an order from the court after considering all the relevant circumstances. So no legislation may permit um, any arbitrary evictions and we apply that strictly. So with regards to our rental stock or any rental stock, this means that a tenant may not be evicted without a court order, even if the tenant is in breach of the rental agreement, for example, non-payment of rent. And we also apply that legislation or section 26 of the constitution to all um, households or persons residing in a household um, that doesn't, or a, a house or a property that doesn't belong to them. Further to that, regulation 11 CA, um, of COVID-19 regulations places a moratorium on all evictions during the lockdown period. 
which means that no person may be evicted from the place of residence, regardless of whether it is a formal or an informal residence, a farm dwelling, or any other form of dwelling for the duration of the lockdown. Further to that, the above moratorium covers all forms of displacement of persons from dwellings and or residences. However, we, um, as the custodians of the Rental Housing Tribunal, the jurisdiction is to investigate and hear complaints of illegal evictions, and it's limited, limited to evictions relating to rental housing sectors. So it can be private or public property, but it doesn't extend to farm dwellers, evictions, or any other households. So it's only rental um, market, rental housing market. And the other evictions are also covered under Extension of Security of Tenant Act, or what we call um, illegal invasions of vacant land or related matters. So such matters fall exclusively within the juris jurisdiction of the civil courts. Again, no one may be evicted without a court order. During the lockdown period, um, the Rental Housing Tribunal received and attended to approximately 159 inquiries, which are mainly, mainly relating to unlawful notices, arrears of rental payment, termination of municipal services, so the landlord or the owner of the property would terminate access to um, municipal services, unlawful evictions and illegal lockouts, and then hearings that did not take place because of the lockdown, we will assess all those um, applications or queries that were referred to the Rental Housing Tribunal um, now that we've declared the Rental Housing Tribunal as an essential service. They are also preparing themselves, their workplace and the infrastructure to um, administer some of these cases. In some areas, um, requests were made where um, tenants asked that they Deposits be utilised in lieu of the payment of a monthly rental, but that is again just an arrangement between the landlord and the tenant. No moving in and out during lockdown um, unless um, the, it's by arrangement and we are now allowed to, to move from one dwelling to another. Um, again, not through an eviction, but um, willing movement. And then also the Rental Housing Tribunal provides general advice. So we have rudimentary, we always had um, some officials available to assist them, general, general inquiries, inquiries around this. But what we are doing now, we're going to advance where we're actually taking cases, going through the administrative processes and having hearings on those um, eviction orders or um, where this landlord tenant um, disputes. I'll move on now to how we address um, congestion around housing structures and what measures are in place where there are um, positive cases of COVID-19 identified. I just want to, as introductory remarks indicated, is um, largely um, guided by health um, regulations and requirements. And in some instances, um, the community will um, present cases of people um, having symptoms. But it is a health response. Um, HRD, um, Jackie Gooch, referred to quarantine and isolation sites and how that is dealt with and the movement of those people. So in our areas, um, obviously, we have quite a number of highly congested areas. In informal segments, even in formal areas, you have overcrowded dwellings, you have backyard dwellings on formal sites. So in each of those cases, um, we do um, provide support to that individual and information on what must be done when such cases occur, and also um, assist with referring them for counselling if needed. The health department uh, play a key role here, and it's still uh, mainly the health department's responsibility in dealing with those cases. And we just provide a support role and I'll talk to our reblocking and how we also assist in that. Attempt to establish how that individual got affected. So the entire process um, is um, through a whole of government approach. We assist the Department of Health. Screening also through the Department of Health. Um, 
But what we've done is, and I'll talk to that in detail, is what steps we are taking as a Department of Human Settlements to curb the spread um, or to be proactive in, in preventing the spread of the virus and um, plans that are in place to contaminate, um, a, a cleaning of contaminated areas in uh, public spaces. The de-densification or what we refer to as re-blocking and the identified priority areas, the Noon, Kalicha and Kosovo, those were identified because of the high density. So in order to um, improve or the health conditions, it was necessary to relocate or reduce the number of households in those areas. Again, whenever households are identified for decanting or relocation from existing settlements, it is um, on a volunteer basis and no one is forced to move and the individual still has the right to agree or not to agree to move. So what we've done is um, the Danun and Kosovo uh, settlements or communities plans were already on our housing pipeline um, to do formal dwellings um, or formal relocation areas to assist with the re-blocking of those two settlements. The land parcels that were identified are within walking distance from the existing settlements and that's important to maintain the social and economic and other networks that exist in those informal settlements. So the relocation to the new sites are within walking distance from their current place of residence. Due to the scarcity of land within Kailitra, other sites were identified, one being Itemba, which is currently owned by National Department of Public Works. And um, we've also identified then households from Kailicha and Airport Precinct, that's the informal settlements along or around the airport, along the N2. They will be the recipients of the new um, housing opportunities created in this Itemba site. And then coupled with that, uh, Minister Sasulu's director, directive has necessitated that the department accelerate the plan. So whilst it was in the pipeline, we used this um, COVID-19 um, crisis to accelerate and to de-densify or re-block the current informal settlements, which means we have to de-densify or relocate some of the households out of those dense areas. And that is uh, in an attempt to um, combat the spread of the virus. So this is phase one, what we refer to as phase one, and then a list of phase two informal settlements, and that's throughout province have been identified and work um, is currently also underway to prepare um, new relocation sites or re-blocking those current um, high density informal settlements. And throughout all of this, um, for those um, the Nuna Kosovo sites, as well as the Kailicha, um, um, settlements. We're working closely with the city of Cape Town. It's all located within the metro, as well as working closely with the Housing Development Agency to prepare uh, the implementation plan for these um, for the reblocking of those high density settlements. And then, just to continue with the um, settlements throughout province, so we've moved on to what we call phase two settlements as well. Phase one was just a response to the national departments directive on those three sites. So phase two, we want to highlight, so there's about more or less 50-50 uh, or 60-40 um, number of settlements and number of households. It's also spread about 60-40 between the metro and the non-metro. And so we have 204 um, informal settlements um, in the city of Cape Town. And a large proportion of the informal settlements in the metro, um, that information was um, sourced from 2013 data. Uh, but subsequent to that, um, I can assure you it has increased so the number of households in those informal settlements. We've got some 300 in the non-metro, also sourced from um, 2016 data, recent data. So the rapid growth is um, essentially found in Tiavata's Clue of Area, Overstand, Nysna, Mossel Bay, and the city of Cape Town. So that's where the rapid growth is experienced currently. And as part of our COVID-19 um, response plan or um, intervention plan from the Department of Human Settlements, we've identified the list of 
uh, really high risk areas in terms of the highest number of households or the highest density. And we have put plans in place to assist municipalities um, as well as Department of Water and Sanitation to identify the areas where there's water shortage. So National Department of Water and Sanitation has made resources available. A um, Rand Water was appointed at a national level as implementing agent and in the Western Cape um, Overberg Water Board was appointed. And we've assisted the Department of Water and Sanitation to identify the high density areas or the settlements, whether it's formal or informal, where there's a water shortage and where uh, water tanks must be provided. We've also identified um, land and projects on our pipeline, that's currently on our pipeline, that falls within close proximity to hotspots, so where there are hotspots or high, hotspots or high occurrence of number of um, positive COVID-19 cases. Um, we've identified um, land and projects in close proximity to that to assist in the de-densification of hotspot areas or re-blocking those areas to reduce the number of households. And that we're also um, using this process to just accelerate on that. And then further to that, um, we always use every engagement and every possible way to communicate um, with with um, communities uh, just to keep them informed of processes and the implications of and, and acting responsibly. So through every engagement we use that as a chance just to um, communicate to them why we need to re-block and um, what the um, implications or what um, positive impact it has on curbing the, the um, spread of the virus. And then if I can drill down to the detail, um, we've got the phase one projects. Um, as I indicated, the noon, Kosovo and the airport precinct, those um, communities that were already part of the pipeline where um, our new developments um, will benefit them. So the relocation from those areas to new developments, new human settlement developments. The timber site was added. These are national public work sites, so there's a further opportunity to re-block and, and move households um, to the new development. Phase two, um, in conjunction with the municipalities, we've identified phase two. The criteria we've applied is 100, more than 100 dwelling units per hectare and more than 1,000 households within a particular settlement. And uh, we also looked at projects that's ready for implementation or other sites or other projects that we can accelerate um, procurement processes or procurement of development rights. And then in some instances, um, temporary relocation areas were identified and service sites provided. What we've done is um, we've also applied a new approach. Um, so for um, previously, um, when we have emergency housing scenarios, the emergency housing program is applied and we looked at that and we use this as an opportunity to identify how can we improve on the service delivery. We've already instituted some of this on, um, on our emergency housing, one being um, Silvertown in Kailicha area. So previously um, services were provided, rudimentary services were provided through the emergency housing program with only one ablution facility for five households. We are now looking at providing uh, our permanent relocation areas with the dwelling units. We'll look at one kitchen for each family and one ablution um, facility for maximum of two family sharing. Um, in some instances, where possible, we have one on one ablution facility, um, but the maximum would be two household sharing as opposed to five previously. The provision of a water point or stand pipe for every 25 families, we are um, providing one on one um, water tap and provision. Shelter, the minimum size was 18 square meters. We've increased the minimum size, minimum size to 24, um, with a maximum of 30 square meters. It's still smaller than your normal um, subsidized house, which is 40 square, but it is an improved um, unit size. We've also looked at ways to improve um, the maintenance costs or to reduce the maintenance cost. Maintenance cost. 
Um, we looked at um, where the blockages are in the infrastructure. So all our um, developments will also look at how the reticulation and how we feed into existing systems and how we do we prevent um, blockages. Intermunicipal municipal services are replaced with formalized uh, municipal services. Uh, it also includes water and electricity and also looking at how we can reduce the vandalism of those services as well as wastage of services. And then of course we look at the durability of our structures and increasing and improving on the lifespan of it. Also obviously reducing overall um, maintenance costs and just uh, looking at a better quality of a unit type. So we moved away from those um, corrugated iron and formal structures that you would see in Blackisdorf, for example, looking at a more permanent structure, which is also flexible and can be adapted to um, form a normal uh, BNG or subsidized house and meet those minimum requirements uh, or a social house, social housing unit. Then the specifications looks at the um, performance of those structures in terms of acoustics, the thermal performance, water resistance, energy usage, condensation, just improving the durability of it and also the fire rating, um, just at least one hour um, fire rating. Just to continue the specific uh, specifications and the new units or the approach. Also, I mentioned the increase in the minimum size, uh, provision of a bathroom, which will include a shower, toilet and basin, so within the unit, um, a kitchen and a sink within the unit. And then we ensure that um, we have the um, structural engineer sign off and certify the unit so that it also complies with SAMS 10400 um, specifications. Then those are just typical typologies where we moved away from the single dwelling um, corrugated iron or other um, building material used to a more aesthetically pleasing unit. Um, also multi stories, stories there by increasing the densities and the number of opportunities we can present. That's also a different typology used and in these cases all of it can be converted to a normal um, BNG. Um, or just with minimal um, conversion, it can comply with our normal subsidy housing um, criteria or specification. And then there's just a typical layout for the noon. Now, the noon phase one, the 1,500 units, forms part of a bigger development. Um, the noon comprises 17 hectares, and we're only using two hectares now for phase one. and. Um, there, all the applications are now just for phase one um, while we're doing the detailed planning on the balance. So it will form part of an integrated development, making provision for mixed land uses, social economic facilities, linking to existing infrastructure, transport infrastructure, and so forth. Um, we've applied this in Kailicha Solvatan, which was also emergency housing funding, and we've also looked you get improved units or different types of units um, to accommodate or provide um, more improved performance of our units and more acceptable aesthetically and so forth of those units. So we've already applied um, that concept in Kailicha. Then just um, the last leg of the presentation, we were asked to look at partnerships and just the provision of um, water supply in those high density settlements. I've indicated earlier that we're working with the National Department of um, Water and Sanitation, but even before lockdown, when uh, we were really faced with the risk of COVID-19, we internally in the department and with our partners and municipalities, housing development agency looked at streams internally. So that's communication, employment, wellness, our own employees, uh, de-densification or re-blocking, basic services, finance, supply chain and contract management, coordination and approval. So that's procurement of development rights and how we then work with our other sector departments on that. And then just sharing of information and data. So internally, we already have these streams that look to um, have a holistic approach when we address this. 
Then with specific reference to water provision, the Department of Water and Sanitation has made resources available. We've identified the areas where the water tanks must be provided and um, also tankers for actual provision of water as well as ongoing topping up and making sure that those tanks are full. And this was also part of the effort to, um, to curb the spread. So we all identified or acknowledged that um, regular washing of hands and certain hygiene practices um, assist in uh, preventing the spread. And in uh, many cases um, in our, like for our province, especially in the high density areas, formal and informal, there was a water shortage and the supply was then augmented by the resources provided by Department of Water and Sanitation. So water tanks have been delivered to the different municipalities. We've assisted them in identifying the locations. And the municipalities were also requested to look at um, if there's any shortage or if they require assistance in ongoing maintenance. So that project is underway since the start of lockdown and the last um, tanks are being installed now with the final um, tanks uh, should be complete by the 8th of June, according to the program. Just um, I spoke about sharing of information and data. So through the basic services um, work stream, we've collected data and we've shared that information or assisted um, the municipalities as well as water and sanitation under the provision of where the water tanks must be provided and actual location of it. Those are just typical mapping and data that we, that we provide and all that information is obviously available. And then um, that's just a spreadsheet of the um, installation and um, what's our where we are with the progress of that and what future storage requirements are. So some municipalities have indicated that the supply there won't be sufficient and um, future need has been identified and we, and we are assisting the municipalities in getting additional um, water tanks just to um, cover that shortage that they're currently experiencing. But it does assist in um, providing water to those settlements so that um, some health uh, practices can be implemented, people can wash their hands and, and through that we also use that as an opportunity to educate people um, on just combating the spread. That's the anticipated time frame as I indicated at June that will be completed. Some installation challenges have initially been experienced, but these are all now um, sorted out. Some procurement, um, local contractors had to be procured to install the tanks to make a, a slab or a site, uh, prepare the site um, where this, this water tank will be positioned. Um, material, local supply, also with lockdown, there was also um, limited material available budget. In some uh, instances or on some sites, um, the 5,000 kept um, funding per site, um, it wasn't sufficient for the provision or just the preparation of the site for the water tanks. Um, unfortunately, some community dynamics as well, and we've already experienced um, some uh, vandalization at uh, the um, tank sites or the tanks itself. Um, we've provided information to our prof jocks um, to assist with just law enforcement around that. So we've provided the coordinates of where the sites are, the water tanks are located, so they can also just assist and obviously also monitor um, crowding of people, social distancing and so forth at those facilities. Again, we always use this as an opportunity to communicate and inform people. So again, some challenges were experienced there, there at the start of this, when we started installing the water tanks, but with time that has improved as well. Um, I spoke about some of the risk factors. Um, so with regards to cleansing and sanitation, there are um, many of the informal settlements that have shared services. So we must also ensure that those facilities are regularly cleaned and maintained. I know uh, in most municipalities they have um, 
improved on the cleansing uh, um, program, but we also find that um, in order to combat that, we have to have a specific program and specific interventions are required to ensure um, regular cleaning and sanitization of, of those um, tanks and the communal facilities. And Ms. Sampson, could I ask if you could please wrap up in the next few minutes, sure. please? Okay, we, um, I just want to indicate that we haven't received any funding from National Department of Human Settlements, Water and Sanitation. They have um, funded the provision of water tanks, but no other um, funding um, was received from National Department, so we still continuously try to um, access additional funding. I spoke about that. and. With regards to the water and sanitation, we've prepared a, a full-on plan um, looking at the profile of each um, settlement, the number of households, what is required in terms of janitorial services, regular maintenance, and that has been provided to the municipalities, all 25, and it has been implemented in some of the municipalities. PITO is an example of PITO and how they apply. So we've listed um, how often the um, where the sites are, often it must be cleaned, what PPE is required or other material or equipment is required to ensure um, that those shared uh, ablution facilities um, and, and water um, standby spots are cleaned regularly. Thank you. Other intervention, um, we used our provincial um, planning NGOs to escalate community issues and use it as a channel um, for communication between government and the communities. We've engaged with our partners here, Environmental Affairs and Development Planning and streamlining the planning and environmental approvals. Also ongoing learning through different platforms, WhatsApp groups and so forth. And then every opportunity is used and now that we have a whole of government approach to ensure that there's improvement in behavior to combat um, the spread of the virus. So we we ramped up on our communication and then use local um, community to, networks to assist us with that. Thank you. There's just the spread of the NGO. Um, I've spoken about that already. So thank you, um, Chairperson and members. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sampson, to you uh, and Minister Simmers for uh, having prepared that information uh, for the committee. Um, we are then going to move to um, uh, questions uh, and answers from both departments. But before we do, I'm going to ask that we just take a brief five minute break. I'm sure there are many participants on the meeting who would just like to stretch their legs uh, briefly. So we will be um, uh, we will reconvene then at quarter past two. That's 1415. Uh, please do not leave the meeting, uh, but if you could please uh, put your microphones on mute and we will reconvene in five minutes. Thank you very much.
Park committee meeting. Uh, questions from the members. As usual, we will have uh, three minutes per party, starting with the DA. Are there any questions from the DA, please? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, um, before I start with my three minutes, with your indulgence, um, I'm going to ask if we, uh, if myself and Honourable Matlori could share the first round. So I'll do um, half of it and then Honourable Matlori will come in. Yeah, no problem, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, so before you do, if I could just ask that um, when members are posing their questions, if they could please start with their name and then also indicate to which department their question is posed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Dalen Mitchell and it's posed to the Department of uh, transport and public works. Chair, um, um, I want to start off with there was um, the the HOD. Um, oh, let me first say thank you very much for the presentation and for a well um, well answered and anticipation um, of the questions. Um, the the HOD referred to the the MEC that launched. I think on the 18th of May, he launched the Red Dot service. So if the minister could just give us some um, more more information around that, I'm, I'm led to believe that it's the first in, in South Africa, and in particular with this COVID situation or pandemic, um, I think it would be, it would be um, good for the members of this committee to have more information around that. Um, Chair, I want to move to, um, uh, to isolation facilities, and in particular, um, the HOD referred to um, having to adjust the, the 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 process um, with the identification, and I want to touch on the Overberg district um, that has a relatively low quarantine and isolation facilities available. I think there was only five, um, and given the rate of infection and the possible increase over the next couple of weeks, how was the adequacy? Um, and I suppose in all um, uh, in all districts, how was the adequacy measured? Um, to get to a certain identification um, of the amount of, of quarantine and isolation sites. Um, then, Chair, um, I want to ask, is it, um, is it possible that the department could make uh, uh, available to the committee a list of all quarantine and isolation sites in the province? I know that there was a slide indicating per district, um, but um, if we could get a direct um, um, list of where they are situated. And um, on 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 those quarantine and isolation sites, which ones um, are currently active, and when will they all be active with regards to 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 accommodating um, um, patients? Um, and then I know that the Western Cape government chair has has been um, has been community focused with the testing and the screening and hotspot focused. Will quarantine and isolation sites be made available? In the the in the communities, um, as identified by the Department of Health, um, um, going forward, um, and then lastly, Chair, um, with regards to um, um, the quarantine um, and isolation facilities, um, we are currently in the month of Ramadan for our Muslim colleagues, and um, I just wanted a I understand if the the quarantine and isolation facilities are making provision for um, uh, halal facilities for um, members are, that is currently, or patients that currently in isolation and facilities use, you are being used. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Mitchell. Um, the time, the three minutes have then expired. I'll now recognize the ANC. Honorable Ventvogel, do you have any questions? Yes. Thank you. Please proceed. Jefferson, mine is um, um, I have seen disturbing images at Denebos uh, quarantine site in Sirius, and the conditions there is terrible. So now I want to know. Um, who does the cleaning in these facilities and how many times per week? Um, if I can just get an answer on that. And then what is the total numbers and details of additional isol isolation uh, facilities earmarked for the peak time? 
um, chairperson, then um, I just want also to know what progress has been made with regards to the conversion of the CTICC into a COVID-19 hospital and how much is, is budgeted for it and who are the service providers and will, will it be completed and ready for patients intake? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the ANC? I don't then see any um, representatives from the EFF, but just to check, are there any representatives from the EFF that would like to pose a question? None. We then move um, on to the good party. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, if I may start with questions to um, the Department of Transport and Public Works and first around the quarantine and isolation sites. Um, if we can just get clarity, so the Department of Public Works is um, identifying and if I understood it correctly, establishing the quarantine and isolation sites. Um, and, I, and, I, and I assume that they're not, that that department is not operating them, that they are being established and then handed over to the Department of Health. So if we could just get clarity about the operational aspects of the um, quarantine and isolation sites, once they've been established, are they then handed over to the Department of Health in the entirety for operations? Um, or does the department continue to be involved in the operations of those sites? Then uh, the, the kind of um, build up of, of quarantine and isolation sites I thought was quite interesting. Um, and that the you know the the ones that are going to require the major um, fit out being parking lots and sports fields are obviously not being um, developed now. Um, I may be wrong, but that's the way I understood it. Um, but so does that mean that if the crunch comes and we need a rapid increase in the numbers, um, how soon will we will we be able to add sites um, if the the major fit out ones are, are being left to last. So my question really is also linked to the, um, the current capacity. There was a slide showing 355 or 3,559 beds, I think, which I, I assume are in the existing uh, Q&I um, facilities. And there was a, a note that 3,306 people can be accommodated till the end of July. But if, you're, if we're following what, what the Premier has been saying over the last week about the rapid increase in infections and what this could mean for the pressure on the health system, uh, 3,306 doesn't sound like enough between now and the end of July. So if we can get clarity on that, whether that is enough according to the modelling or whether there is work that's been done that will add capacity before the end of July. Um, and then um, lastly, to transport, um, I mean, while we've been in lockdown, we've, I assume that, um, I'm hoping that some work has been done on the central line so that when we move out of lockdown in our different phases, whatever phase comes next and whenever it comes, um, you know, public transport is a place obviously where there's high density of people in confined spaces and having the central line fully operational or operational as according to the plan that was presented um, a couple of months ago, the phased um, um, opera, opera, operationalizing, sorry, I can't get the word out now, but uh, implementing central the central line um, according to that plan, that would be important to know whether that is still on track. And then if I may move to um, human settlements, because linked, I, I just, uh, this is my last question, just linked to that question is human settlements around the central line is the relocation of informal settlements in the rail reserve. What progress has been made with that? Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Heron. Um, I now recognise the ACDP. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, just human settlements first. Um, we know the uh, the three informal settlements that was mentioned uh, for the reblocking the Danun, Kosovo, of Philippi and Kailicha. Um, I just want to know from the department, uh, one, is uh, are they working towards uh, working according to a waiting list system or is that abandoned for, for, for this? I know the importance of getting people, um, you know, to, to reblock and uh, get 
the 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 informal settlement sorted out but um it's very difficult i think um to live in an informal settlement with all the rules and regulations they need to comply with and that's why i don't know but the noon and of course kailicha um the infection rate is is rising and 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 how soon will these people be moved so is it are they working according to a housing waiting list and how soon will uh, these people be moved if they are moved um uh, rapidly in order because we we believe that the peak will hit us at the end of june now um just another question there um the the queries for the rental uh, housing tribunal the queries 159 i believe um uh, um the the question and i know about the moratorium and people not being evicted but but I, I just want to know, um, you know, uh, with all the queries, uh, illegal lockouts, and all of those type of things, is the is the housing tribunal making headway? Are they are, are they getting to some point of uh, assisting people, uh, or is it just queries and 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 nothing happened? Do they trace those queries, for, especially where you have illegal lo lo um, lockouts and limited services and those type of things? If they can just give us some brief, are are they getting somewhere with assisting people? Um, I also heard um, uh, about the Blakistorp, and you know this is has been a, a discussion for a long, long time because people will move there temporarily and now um the the department is talking about more permanent structures there what is the situation in Blockisdorp at the moment uh do we have uh social distancing there what is happening in Blockisdorp? just give us some up update and is the people uh, you know um uh, uh, well there because my understanding was years back it was only temporary housing and uh, now people are still living there um uh, permanently uh, maybe just to the to the other department, uh, transport and public works. Uh, uh, of course, um, public transport is an important role, plays an important role, and uh, I'm very pleased to hear that you have this uh, cell phone based system where passengers can give feedback. But what do you do uh, when you have um, habitual offenders? What is the penal provisions? Uh, if people do not comply um, uh, now, especially if we move down to a level three, more and more people will go to work. And uh, we know, you know, the, the, the history of the taxi industry. Um, uh, are people adhering to 70 uh, percent in the vehicle? And what is going to happen going forward when the demand is greater uh, when it gets to work? OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Christians. Are there any questions from the Freedom Front Plus? None. Um, we'll then hand over to the departments to respond to some of those questions. Um, let's start with the Department of Transport and Public Infrastructure. Um, over to you, uh, Minister Madikizela. Colleagues, thank you very much uh, for those questions. Um, I think there was only one question directed to me. Um, the question was about the Red Dot service. Um, yes, we launched this initiative on the 18th um i mean the the reason why we had to launch this kind of initiative is because the department was inundated with calls particularly from uh, the health workers your nurses uh, who could not get transport after the curfew period um and we we then got together with the the, the minibus taxi industry in the western cape uh, and we agreed, um, they agreed to form a company, uh, which they call Umanyano. Um, we then launched, you know, this um, initiative, which is a very good initiative. And these taxis will only be operating uh, from seven in the evening. Um, they will transport, you know, essential service workers, uh, particularly health workers, and but i think after the launch of this uh, initiative i mean um, we also i personally received a number of calls uh, people asking whether this cannot be extended you know to other essential service workers and i think it's something that we need to look at um because um the the demand um, um is clearly there that many people because of the curfew that was introduced you know are left stranded you know after seven um, so we started with 100, you know, minibus taxis. 
And of course, um, given the demand, um, we are looking at increasing the number of, of the minibus taxes up to 400. But of course, as I said, it will likely depend on the demand that is also now coming from other, you know, essential service workers, you know, beside the health workers. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, HOD. The chairperson, um, if I can then try and deal, I'm, if you're comfortable, I won't necessarily deal with them all in the order in which they were posed, um, but I will try to make sure, and if I need to, I'll call on some inputs from my colleagues that are in the meeting as well, if that would be acceptable to you, Chair. Perfectly, thank you. Thank you. So as far as the, let me then start with the quarantine and isolation, and there were obviously a number of questions posed uh, from various uh, members of the committee around quarantine and isolation. And, and perhaps I'm going to start with, with the process and um, through your chair to Honourable Member Heron, the, the question about the identification and establishment of the quarantine and isolation sites absolutely, uh, that as a department we're responsible to identify them working also with the uh, local authorities, with the municipalities to determine if they have facilities that are uh, available to be utilized, um, as well as then any others. And we've also obviously been working with the National Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. Now, in terms of the, the guideline that was issued, there is generally the view that they would be, that we would identify the facility. And as you then indicate, it would be handed over to the Department of Health to put into operation. In general, the view, though, is that when you're looking at a quarantine or isolation facility from a government perspective, normally, if, if you or I were potentially exposed or possibly um, COVID positive, we would be asked as far as possible to quarantine or isolate ourselves at home um, on the assumption that we've got the facilities to do so uh, in terms of our environment. But clearly what we understand is that not everybody can do that. Um, and, and given the situation that we have from a community point of view, the government needs to make sure that there are facilities available for that. And so in some instances, apart from obviously isolation where somebody is COVID positive, you do need the process where the Department of Health check in, they do the kind of temperature checks, the screening, they, they ask the necessary health related questions but particularly if somebody's in quarantine, really what you're trying to do is provide them a home away from home. You're trying to provide them with a space where, where they are, where they're safe, um, where they're comfortable, and, and hopefully where after X many days, 14 or less, depending on when they go into quarantine, they are, they are held and hearty and are able to then go home. So the um, process that we've put in place with the guideline with our Department of Health, which they have discussed with National, is that um, generally, the Department of Health works with us in part, part, um, participating and making sure that the facility is brought into operation, but they're not the ones that are managing the facility on a day-to-day -day basis. They need to focus their time and attention on, on, the, on the health response. And so the facility management and operation, operationalization, I'm also twisting my tongue on that, um, is not something then that is covered from the Department of Health. Obviously, um, we're all new to this, and so we are uh, working things out a little bit as we go. And, and certainly then we found in some areas where things have worked very well, uh, we've come up against potential issues, challenges, find ways to resolve them, working with the different, different players that we can. Your questions about the, the crunch time and the major fit outs and so on are things where, as I spoke about, having to try and adapt and understand the strategy based upon the numbers um, that we are, are having to potentially respond to. So um, it is important to understand that we've been working with the Department of Health um, as far as the Q&I response is concerned to try to understand what kind of numbers are we potentially um, needing to respond to. And based upon their models, and understanding that obviously, as I'm sure the committee is also aware, their modeling does adjust um, based upon what is actually happening or what they're seeing on the ground. There was a potential that um, at one point in terms of the modeling data that were shared with us, that if we followed a, an upper path or upper trajectory, we would need to be looking in uh, June, July at isolating about 11,500 people and quarantining 53,000. 
And when you just put then the kind of costs to that, um, it becomes a number that, that is, is not um, financially doable. Based upon our cost analysis of what's required throughout the whole process, we'd be running close to the 3 billion rand mark uh, to have to fund or pay from a quarantine and isolation perspective. So we've been working with the Department of Health to try to unpack this further and understand what does this mean and whether there are other ways to approach quarantine and isolation, which is why I think um, in terms of that first slide that I showed in the quarantine side of things, we spoke about the WHO levels and particularly then that when you get into broad community transmission, the efficacy or the effectiveness of, of quarantine and isolation and putting people into large numbers of people for quarantine and isolation is very limited. And the focus rather has to shift um, from what the Department of Health and what we've engaged with them on in understanding what we need to provide from an infrastructure perspective. We rather need to shift your focus to quarantine and isolation to be able to support the vulnerable people in the community. So those with comorbidities, elderly and so on. So um, there is a different uh, response therefore uh, from a numbers point of view. So when I showed the slide that had the kind of different escalation possibilities, certainly that one in those kind of large scale parking lots, fields, etc. I can give you an assurance that my team has already got costings for that. We've got an idea of where the suppliers are, what would be required, etc. So should we get to that point, we would be able um, to respond as we're moving towards it. And what we are trying to do, and when you asked about the numbers, is that we are trying to make sure that we have a sense of we're still continually trying to find possibilities, more sites, test them, et cetera. So, for example, there's been um, the start of a conversation with the, with the South African police services to be able to access their training uh, facilities. And they've got training, their training academies that can bring on stream between 1,200 and 2,000 beds. But that, that hasn't been kind of locked in the system, if I could put it that way. And therefore, we haven't added that to the numbers. So what we've shown you are really those that have been committed at this point, not only not those that we've still got on the radar and that we're still working on trying to assess and, and figure out. So when the question was then asked uh, through you, Chair, by Member Mitchell um, about the Overberg area, um, in terms of the five identified and what's the adequacy that we use to measure the amount. As far as we're concerned, we are continually trying to find more facilities, looking at if we have to take potentially a community hall or a sports center or, or whatever may be available, potentially even warehouse space, and look at then what would it take to convert it, get the cost for that, understand what it's going to be, how long it would take, and then make sure that we give ourselves enough time to do that as and when necessary. So we are trying to be as pragmatic, I think is the new word that everybody's using in the current situation as possible and bring on stream and keep identifying and working on more and more facilities as necessary. So I agree with, with the questions. We, we certainly don't in terms of the numbers that we do need would be needed, that we've got them all on stream by no means. We are continuing on that. Um, actively as a department. The question about the list of sites being available, where they're situated, how many beds and so on. Obviously, I, I did not include those in, in the presentation given the sensitivity that, that can arise out of it with some of the security issues and others. Um, so certainly through your chair, um, that's why it wasn't included in any detail in the presentation. Um, but and uh, you know, if I may say through you, Chair, from a confidentiality point of view, um, if that can be made available and held within that space, um, I would I would ask that that be respected, if if I may. Then um, the question about making provision for um, our our uh, citizens who need to observe the Eid um, and and different practices. Absolutely, we have made provision for that. Um, also in terms of the catering uh, and the necessary approaches. Through you, Chair, to Honourable Vinfelho's comments, um, I must indicate I agree with you. Last evening when I received the images um, of the site, the Denebo site, my response was probably not as polite as, as yours has been uh, in the meeting this afternoon. 
Um, as it stands, that is a municipal facility and we've been working with the municipality. They're the ones who've been taking on the responsibility of cleaning and managing the facility. Um, it, it is something completely different to what they are and have been used to in terms of running a resort um, or facility of this nature historically. And so we have picked up and been working with them. Um, and I indicated to my team, we um, will necessarily kind of step in and take take responsibility for that and provide the necessary assistance to make sure that that doesn't continue and that we don't have a repeat of what um, we see has come out um, in those particular um, pictures. I agree with you, not only are disturbing, but are just absolutely horrific. Um, so I've given you a sense in terms of the what's necessary from, from a peak point of view in terms of the model, but that is not what we're going to be able to respond to. Not from a, if, if somebody was to tell me, Itchity Gooch, you've got all the money in the world, go out there, I promise you now we would be able to make a plan and respond to the numbers that are necessary. My team and I are committed and are able to, to um, do that to the best of our ability. But financially, it's not sustainable. Uh, and not only that, but uh, from a health point of view, based upon what the team has been sharing, when we get to the level of community transmission uh, in certain areas, as I said to you, the efficacy of Q&I uh, is really not there for that point. That does not mean that you halt Q&I, you continue with quarantining and isolation, particularly in the areas in terms of your clusters, your sporadic cases, and so on. Um, and that is, is vitally necessary. Through you, Chair, to move on to the questions about um, the CTICC that were posed. In terms of the initial hire agreement that has been concluded, um, the cost of the CTICC for the initial rental period where there is zero rental being charged. So in other words, the actual facility is not being charged for, but the operational costs related to the CTICC uh, are included. That initial rental period is 47 million rand. Uh, obviously, the Department of Health still needs to start with put in the health equipment and so on. Service providers, clearly, um, I can tell you that this is the CTICC itself. And then there's a company called Scan Display, who are the ones who are actually erecting the internal working. So putting up all the equipment of the walls and so on inside uh, the facility of the CTICC. Everything is due to be ready in terms of operational data from the 8th of June. And we are still on track um, for that in terms of operation. Then um, if I may move on to the transport questions chair. We work on the central line certainly uh, through your chair to Member Heron. We've still been engaging with the uh, with PASA around the central line and uh, interacting with them. And there has been ongoing discussions around the relocation um, of people uh, out of the rail reserve. And I'll leave that for um, Ms. Sampson to respond to because you sent that question through to her. But absolutely, that will be intent bringing those different systems on online. I must say, obviously, that um, the that PRASA has got a plan um, that they are working towards as the lockdown levels uh, are reduced, and that they would not be bringing, obviously, the entire rail system on track uh, necessarily uh, when we move to lockdown level three, lockdown level two. They will be doing that uh, step by step through and across the rail system as they implement the type of measures that they need to from a social distancing, hygiene, and so on. Um, that work on the central line is still continuing, the engagements also the REU and others that is still in place. And then um, the last question uh, through your chair ab to about the habitual offenders um, who don't comply with the necessary requirements from a public transport perspective. If I may, just to give so you don't listen to my voice all the time, I'd like to ask Advocate Reinecke if he would mind speaking to the potential measures one can take one can uh, take in relation particularly to dealing with operators linked to their operating licenses and so on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me just uh, then uh, come in there. Um, on the 16th of April, April Ma uh, Chief Magistrate Lewitz uh, basically approved a fine list for people found to transgress. 
So if, as an example of that, if someone were caught uh, driving uh, and, and not adhering to the vehicle capacity um, uh, regulations, uh, 1,500 rand exists. And so then if our traffic officers were uh, found anyone on the road to, uh, who were transgressing any of those regulations, they would have imposed the appropriate fine. However, when 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 these fine uh, when the regulations don't exist uh, or, or when there are no fines imposed for a particular transgression, uh, there are various actions that we take as a department. So um, let's, for example, say for example the sanitization. Um, we, we, uh, uh, we believe that there isn't a, a appropriate sanitization uh, on vehicles and so forth. We would normally intervene with, with by communication, by assisting with sanitization and so forth. Um, as far as the uh, transgressors um, that are, are uh, continuously transgressing, um, we are able to uh, actually impose, well, call for what's called the Section 79 hearing in terms of the National Land Transport Act and uh, and actually proceed against them and withdraw their operating license if they continuously transgress. Um, we haven't implemented that at, at this moment in time. At this moment in time, our actions have been focused on uh, enlightening uh, and communication. Uh, we will be moving into the next phase uh, where we actually look at uh, utilizing Section 79 of the NLTA to actually uh, uh, hold operators to account and possibly either suspend the operating licenses or withdraw the operating licenses at this point. Uh, Madam Chair, I think therefore that we have dealt with the, the questions posed unless I have missed one. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll then move on to the Department of Human Settlements. Uh, Minister Simmons, over to you. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'll take two of the questions. Uh, the one pertaining to the center line relocation progress, and I'll be, I'll be supplemented by my HOD as well. I'll deal with the Blicky's door question. Then I'll just ask that Pila Maisela deal with the two specific questions from the member of the ACDP pertaining to beneficiary process uh, under the difficult circumstances, but also how soon the movement of these envisaged beneficiaries will happen. And I'll ask that Nathan Adrian, so please address the question pertaining to the rental housing tribunal queries, but also are they making headway with these plus minus 159 queries. Madam Chair, pertaining to the central line relocation progress, over the last five weeks, we, between myself and Minister Medikizela, we have had uh, virtual meetings with Minister Mbalula, but also Minister Delo. And the last successful meeting which we had, all parties agreed that we would to join together with the city of Cape Town, look at possible pockets of land within a 10 kilometer radius from the central line where these individuals could, could be relocated to because uh, the figure has now ballooned to well over 8,000 informal structures as per the city of Cape Town's contribution in these meetings. As a Department of Human Settlements, we have emphasized to both Mr. Mbalula but also Minister Delo that we do have specific uh, projects earmarked already in, in advanced stages, uh, which may be able to accommodate uh, a X number of qualifying beneficiaries of, from these uh, um, informal structure inhabitants along the center line but uh, that there is a pocket of land belonging to the, the National Department of, of Public Works which if Minister Delo could expedite and hand over power of attorney to either the city of Cape Town or the HDA it will, it will further enhance our foot our um, footprint on, on the on the specific site where we can accommodate plus minus 3,000 of these people living uh, living along the, the center line because we do recognize the crucial importance of this to our economy in, in the metro area. Madam Chair, in, in the Blicky's Dorp situation, my last engagement with the mayor pertaining to the to Blicky's Dorp was that a fair number of the original in, in, uh, beneficiaries of Blicky's Dorp, which were relocated there, have been moved to the, the Delft uh, uh, site where they were actually given homes just prior to the lockdown period. During my personal visit to the site around about two weeks ago, I can say that from the city's perspective, they were cleaning the, 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 the site and removing the refuse on schedule, ensuring that you know 
that the, the area is sanitized uh, effectively. And that, that's what I observed personally pertaining to ensuring that there's social distancing. Uh, I'm not here to answer for the city of Cape Town in that aspect, but what I observed personally, I could say that the inhabitants of the Blickies Dorp area were actually adhering to these regulations. I'll now hand over to my HOD. Uh, Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Minister. Minister covered both um, the rail reserve and how we deal with persons living in the rail reserve. We've had the engagements, as Minister indicated, um, with National Department, both Public Works and Transport, on the centre line. But our approach will look at all the um, households or settlements along the rail reserves throughout the province, and we are looking at how we can incorporate um, those households in our human settlement project. I'll now, through you, Chairperson, hand over to uh, Nathan Adrianza for the Rental Housing Tribunal queries, and then following that uh, for Pila Maisela for the um, Housing Demand Database, that we refer to as Housing Demand Database, and how we deal with that, specifically for the Danoon area. Thank you. Thank you very much, HOD, and thank you very much to the question from the member. Um, as the HOD indicated during the period of lockdown, the offices were closed, but we had staff members who were available to take queries from members of the public. Because remember that the regulations which were published clearly state no evictions, but what we found was that there were a number of instances where um, landlords were in the process of evicting their, their tenants. We engaged with both parties during that process and out of the 159 matters and queries which we received, we managed to deal with about 80% of those cases. Now members must also be aware that the jurisdiction of the tribunal, we can only deal with a matter where there's an actual complaint lodged and as the HOD has made mention now, the HOD together with the minister have taken the decision to determine the rental housing tribunal as an essential service. We are now working through the balance of that 160 to work through and find where those are legitimate complaints. And we are going to be in the next few days, we'll be operating virtually and hearing um, matters. Those matters will only be deemed urgent matters and will cover unlawful evictions or illegal lockouts, will cover failure to provide municipal services, the unlawful seizure of possessions, and this typically takes place where the landlord, um, where there's been a default in terms of rent payment, the landlord then seizes possessions. So I can confirm that from the tribunal perspective, yes, we are making headway. And I think with the determination of the rental housing tribunal as an essential service, we will be in a better position to assist um, both landlords and tenants who are faced with um, potential evictions and where they are, um, both parties are in distress. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Good afternoon, Chairperson. Uh, my name is Pila Maisela, Chief Director responsible for implementation um, in the department. I will respond on the question asked regarding the waiting list um, within um, informal settlements. It is um, correct that it is difficult to follow a strict um, uh, criteria when allocating um, houses within informal settlement, uh, uh, basing it on the waiting list. So for the de-densification programs, we will not necessarily follow the waiting list criteria, but what we've um, resolved to do working in partnership with the city of Cape Town is to focus on um, the identify the vulnerable um, uh, beneficiaries, um, that would be your elderly, um, your disabled, and we even um, uh, in, will be including your, your child-headed household and move them into the relocation areas. 
And once um, they've been moved into the relocation areas, we will then um, proceed with the next phase of within those people that have been identified, allocating them um, their houses if they qualify for BNGs. But as the first phase of ensuring that we commence with the identification, we will not be limited to the waiting list because we do understand the challenges um, that are brought about by um, dealing with just um, a waiting um, list. Regarding the program, we were hoping to start with um, moving people to the transitional areas by the second week of June. However, we have been um, experiencing some delays in terms of planning approvals from the local authority. We've submitted a rezoning application and an application in terms of the Section 69 of the Municipal bylaws, which allows us to establish agent housing uh, within these areas. However, we're still waiting for, for that um, approval, and we uh, will not be in a position um, to commence with construction without um, that approval. We are continuing to engage with the city of Cape Town, who have given an undertaking to fast track and accelerate certain activities within the statutory processes. But to date, we have not yet received any any feedback in, in, in that regard. We have appointed the professional teams. Uh, we've got the designs. Um, we are ready um, to commence. We've even gone out on a request for proposal um, calling for service providers who um, have got the capacity to deliver the units um, within time. And we are just now waiting for the necessary approvals to be in place before we can comment. Thank you, Chairperson. Are those all the inputs? Madam Chair, I believe we have answered all the five questions directed to human, to human settlements. Thank you. Thank you very much then to both departments. Uh, we're going to move to another round of questions. Um, again, if a member would just indicate their name uh, as well as to which department their question is directed. Um, I'm going to start then with the DA. Are there any questions from the DA, please? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Matlodi Maseko. I've got questions for human settlements. Um, I just want to find out from Minister, um, since there is the, the, the lockdown and social distancing is important, what is the manner that is the department doing for community engagements? Because one of the problems that we have with the communities when you implement any project, community engagement is important. And number two, how is how how are you um, ensuring the contractors that are adhering to the COVID-19 directives issued by the department for the the the, the safety and the number three, it will be for the TRAs or the transitional housing programs. I just want to find out the readiness because um, the message is that the peak, it will be around August. With all the spheres of government being involved in implementing the project, does the department see August? you will be done with some of the housing projects for de-densification that you are implementing in Danun or in Kosovo. And the last one, it will be the when you do the de-densification, where are you leaving the backyard dwellers for when you identify where social distancing is has to be implemented? Are you accommodating them ad hoc? as you get the cases or there is a accommodation in your list to make sure you allocate a certain percentage to the TRA or transitional housing for the backyard dwellers. Those are questions that I have, Chair. Thank you. Any further questions from the DA? There's one minute remaining. Yes, Ch uh, Chairperson Ricardo McKenzie. Uh, first question will go to Minister Madikizela. Given that schools opening now on the 1st of June, um, has there been any engagement with the taxi industry and the scholar transport industry about not being overloaded? We know traditionally, and I can speak from my experience, 
cars or taxis or ventures are overloaded, 20 kids in a car on a taxi. How are we going to manage that to avoid the, the, the spread and who's going to monitor it and, and um, police that? My second question going to go to Minister Simmers again in Mitchell's plane. Uh, 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 what is the minister's plan for implementing and planning for new housing developments in Mitchell's plane? You see Mitchell's plane is our spots and we've got various backyarders there and obviously uh, making the spread much easier. And how is the minister going to ensure that the greater uh, cost of our new woodlands projects are integrated between what we know as the traditional colored community and the traditional Kosa community from the other side? And will the, how will the minister ensure that the project achieves its objectives any timelines given that we have been uh, under lockdown the last uh, two months? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Mackenzie. I'll then move on to ANC. Chair, um, Member Sayed speaking, Chair. Honourable Sayed, please proceed. Thank you so much, Chair. Chair, um, my, my questions are for the Transport Department, the MEC. So the one is, look, I think I've been largely covered by Member Mackenzie around the issue of uh, the the amount of learners per taxi and the monitoring in that regard and engagement with the taxi associations. But um, linked to that question, I just wanted to get a sense as to has there been an engagement not only on that, but on the overall strategy around the reopening of schools with the transport sector. Um, I, I, and, 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 and not only taxis, but there are also, as we know, various, I mean, there are, um, there are also, for example, smaller taxis as well, not only your minibus taxis, but I wanted to get a sense also in terms of the hygiene and the sanitation on the particular taxis with regards to the reopening of schools and learners. I wanted to get a sense with that. Um, what's the plan in place? Then also uh, with regards to the numbers of mourners and travelers that have been tested positive for COVID-19 in the Eastern Cape, as well as the long hours spent by travellers at the Eastern Cape um, at the Eastern Cape testing points. I want to understand also um, how did the travellers leave the Western Cape without being tested? There is a discussion around the issue of testing. I just wanted to get a sense of that because we've seen statements from the department in the Eastern Cape, and yeah, we just want to get the grips um, first and this regard. And also. Um, what role is the Western Cape government playing in terms of checking the validity of permits and testing of people who are traveling to and from um, the rest of the provinces? Thank you. No, no. And then finally, how many people have been tested by the provincial government? Those people who have been actually leaving our province and those also entering our province. I just wanted to know if we could get that breakdown. Thank you. Any further questions from the ANC? None. Uh, just want to check. Uh, EFF, is there a representative on the line? Right, I'll move over to Good. Uh, thanks, Chair. I just want to um, follow up on um, some of the responses from the HOD for Transport and Public Works, in particular around the quarantine and isolation sites and the numbers. Um, I mean, the, the number that we get by June, July, we will need 11,000 at the upper on the upper trajectory. We would need 11,500 isolation sites and 53,000 quarantine sites. Um, I wonder if uh, Ms. Gooch can just um, clarify, does that include the the assumption that people who are able to self isolate or quarantine will do so? Or does that mean that we actually need at the on the upper trajectory about 65,000 uh, beds in the public um, health uh, health system. So in other words, is, is the 11,500 and the 53,000, is that what will be needed by people who will not be able to isolate or quarantine themselves? And then um, the comment that you made about um, at some point when we reach broad community transmission, the efficacy of um, Q&I is limited and that we need, need to shift to focusing on vulnerable um, patients. And I, I wonder if she knows or can, can provide um, some um, 
input or clarification as to what when when do we reach broad community transmission where that um, isolating and quarantine um, must happen um, only for vulnerable people? Um, she may not be able to answer that. It may be a health department question, but I, if she does know the answer, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, move on to the ACGP. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, the question to, to transport. Um, if uh, yesterday when I went to, um, to a shop, um, you know, you get tested for your temperature when you enter a shop or a municipal building, and they can exactly tell you you're 32, 34, whatever the case may be, or it's your temperature's too hot, you cannot enter. Uh, did they think of doing that with taxis? Um, seeing that so many people use the taxis, they, that device, I don't know how expensive it is, but it can be a device that can assist um, people getting into the taxi. It takes takes uh, a sec few seconds to do uh, that screening. Uh, did the department uh, think about that? And all maybe you know, extended to all public transport, um, uh, uh, the buses and all of that, and, um, and what did it cost and 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 so on. Uh, the the other question, uh, chairperson, is um, um, the 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 the. Person did answer that for the when I spoke about I'm talking about the waiting list when I spoke about the waiting list, and she said you know the aged um, handicapped child hold it, aided it, the households. I just want to know is that communicated properly to people um, because there can be a lot of unhappiness when it comes to uh, people you know want to uh, relocate and um, other people then are put ahead of them that can cause a lot of chaos. If 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 that is communicated uh, properly, and maybe just the 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 last thing, if I again look at uh, public works, uh, these buildings that were incomplete, you know, uh, what is the uh, uh, um, so of course the timeline now changes, but of course there's additional costs now, maybe you know costing more material, uh, putting security guards there, um, uh, so that the buildings are not vandalized. So so. So I, I know they indicated that, but you know, um, will how how does it affect delivery on 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 essential um, uh, buildings and so on? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions from the Freedom Front Plus? I don't think Honourable Maria is on the line. All right, um, then I'll hand over um, to uh, Minister Simmers to you and your department first this time. You know, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much to the members for the questions. I'll start with Member Maseko, who's asked in Afrikaans, which has four questions. I will answer three of the four, and I'll just ask my HD to respond to the question pertaining to TRA readiness and the movement of uh, beneficiaries, as she said, if it will happen before August. Uh, I will respond to a first question, which relates to community engagement during lockdown. Member Maseko, uh, as a department, also as a minister, you know, I do believe that public participation and community engagement is crucial. And uh, the ends so when the lockdown level, uh, alert level five was announced and it put certain restrictions on our movement as a ministry, but also as a department, uh, we had to find very creative ways to engage and constructive ways to engage our communities more so once my national minister announced specific areas uh, for reblocking which is the noon and the greater Kosovo area. So what we have done in the, the noon area, and we, we are busy utilizing as we speak, the same methodology in the greater Kosovo area, is to actually engage to start off with our, our sub-council chair and the relevant ward councillors or ward councillor where it is uh, more than one councillor or ward being affected. Then to expand it, we, we, we've also included separate meetings both between the ward councillor and the ward committee structure, which according to the Structures Act, is, the, is the, the legal voice of these communities. But we've also come to learn, and as a minister as well over the last year, I've learned that you know in certain communities, there are also formally recognized leadership structures, more so in the noon, which we, we, we've, we've learned. And we also engage them, but also external stakeholders, uh, for instance, the, the Racing Park Pop, uh, Popular Women's Association, 
and uh, we're going to uh, follow the same uh, template as we move into the greater cost of when we have started doing that to ensure that effectively we do give adherence to the, the essence of the constitution, which is to ensure that there's proper public participation and consultation, but utilizing the Structures Act, which emphasizes the, the importance of our ward committee structures and our ward, duly elected ward councillors who, who represent the majority of the electorate within the community and also the broader community as such. How do we ensure that contact is adhered to the guidelines? Well, I, just this week, I've visited basically three of our catalytic sites. Firstly, it was Faras Village. I visited them twice because it's such a big site. I had to do it over a two-day span where I was, I can uh, firmly say that both contactors and even the subcontractors are adhering to the guidelines. Uh, it is a very rigorous, well-administered uh, well system, which means that should anything go wrong on that site, uh, we will be able to trace from a, from this perspective any uh, contractor or subcontractors employee who may be affected, and they've also come on the on the the main site camps uh, availed structures where you know they can actually then remove these people too. Uh, uh, should there be a case or any concerns regarding a specific employee, but uh, I've also been to Flakland yesterday, but also the Al Dal Yusufat. We, uh, once again, very rigorous systems are in place. So I can assure you, remember that our contractors are adhering to those guidelines, but also because we are focusing on the units that are ready for and over to beneficiaries before on the 7th of June, because uh, since then the national minister has changed their mind again, but uh, we are on track to end over well over 1,300 units. And also our contractors are ensuring that even these units are properly sanitized for these new beneficiaries to move into them before on by the 7th of June, um, um, Chairperson. Chairperson, then your question regarding the, the backyarders and how they will benefit. Uh, I'm also in the in the Noon's case, it's uh, the we are we are working with data together with the city of Cape Town to assess exactly what percentage of envisaged beneficiaries that will form part of the reblocking process are actually backyarders. But once we move to the greater Kosovo area where just late last year and early in this year, prior to the lockdown, we had targeted uh, verification and registration drives together with the city of Cape Town in these specific communities. And uh, we have got sufficient data that we are working through. So once we come to the, the stage of identifying uh, beneficiaries for the, the transitional relocation areas and units, we will utilize a data back mechanism and we will be, uh, engage the project steering committees because in these communities we have been busy for more than two to three years through formalized structures to utilize that specific data to assess what percentage of the allotted units will go to our our backyarders because that is one of our top five, five priorities and in this case we should uh, ensure that they also benefit from now on moving forward. A member, uh, I will just ask my HD to answer the question pertaining to the TRA readiness, then I'll move over to answer Member McKenzie's questions. It was directed to me. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'd like to add just to the construction site and what we did as a department um, when we instructed or when we um, gave the directive to the construction industry. Um, how they must um, conduct themselves with resuming construction on our human settlement sites. We left the responsibility with them to ensure that they apply all um, regulatory requirements for the um, establishment of the sites. So safety and health um, requirements have to be in place. With regards to the TRAs and the programming of when people will be relocated, if we move according to the current program we'll start relocating households by the end of july and we will progressively um, move as we construct move the households from the noon site specifically we are so busy with the kosovo um, site and busy with the procurement of development rights so that will take place later we have submitted to national department so phase one is still only the noon kosovo and Kalicha settlements. We have submitted to the National Department the um, balance of the um, high density settlements. Those include um, formal high density areas. So the backyarders are also then 
um, located and they will also then be prioritized. So I'm also just looking at um, how we accommodate the need of backyarders. So it's not just informal settlement dwellers we're accommodating in phase two specifically, but backyarders as well. And then with regards to the question relating to Kailicha being a hotspot and are we addressing that? There are um, projects from both that's administered uh, by our department as well as the city of Cape Town. We specifically, uh, in my presentation, referred to um, Kailicha and um, Silvertown, but we're also looking at uh, Mitchell's Plain and the high density sites. We're also looking at, um, we've got one catalytic project which is a new woodlands where Kailicha um, residents or the housing need there is accommodated in that site. The city of Cape Town have a few and we can provide that list of um, projects to the um, committee if need be. But we are looking at, and that's part of the projects that were in the pipeline and that we're accelerating now to um, address Mitchell's plain need as a hotspot. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just now uh, move on over to Member McKenzie's two questions and my HDS touched on Member McKenzie's first question. I'll just expand on that because the two city projects which are part of the, the Mitchellstown area as well is the Islands Dive uh, project, which will create 700 opportunities, uh, but it is at this stage only a tender stage. Then we also have the, the Beacon Valley project in Mitchellstown which it will create 1,320 opportunities. And I can affirm that the contractor are, is already on, on site, uh, Madam Chair. Let me remember McKenzie's second question, which I think is very crucial, seeing that we seek to ad uh, address the legacies of the, of the past by creating new integrated uh, com com communities, Madam Chair. And I'm going to answer it in, in, in two ways, two member McKenzie, so it can be clear as well. It's firstly that uh, this is a, the projects is a catalytic project which will ensure socio-economic opportunities for both communities that will, will, will benefit. The, our project is, uh, uh, from, is from a provincial perspective will benefit both backyarders but also residents from of informal settlements as well. Uh, we are bringing together residents from different backgrounds whom we are currently assisting in creating also new uh, with communities that will reflect the true demographics of our province. Like I said, we are trying to redress the, the, the spatial injustices of the past. The objectives and timelines, Madam Chair, um, for this specific site, which is uh, a, a shift towards changing and addressing, re redressing the injustices of the past, is that 90% of the earthworks for this specific project has already been completed. And we are due to commence with top structure commencement in next uh, next uh, month, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I believe I have answered the members two questions. Thank you very much. Um, we'll then uh, move over to you, uh, Minister Madikizela. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, to the members who have asked questions, um, in fact, all of these questions do not belong to the Department of Transport, but obviously we have a role to play. To Member Mackenzie, um, obviously the Scholar Transport is, is uh, under the Department of uh, Education, and you might have seen, Member Mackenzie, the statement that was issued by the Minister of Education um, immediately after the announcement by the National Minister last night. And I also spoke to the uh, Minister uh, Schaefer um, because there are two things that we need to do now, working together with the Department of Education. The first thing, of course, is that we've got to restructure the, the contract of the scholar transport so that um, it is in line with the current regulations. Uh, and I'm happy because the minister, um, uh, the provincial minister, <clears throat> also alluded to that um, in her statement. Um, because we have to make sure that those regulations and guidelines from the Department of Health are adhered to. The second thing, of course, that we need to do uh, is to make sure that we really enforce the law. Um, given the high risk that this will, will pose to our kids uh, and the fact that at least for now, uh, the phase approach um, will only allow yeah, grade 7 and grade 12 um, this really gives us 
you know, enough time to monitor the scholar transport in all those areas and make sure that we enforce the law. Um, we are going to have uh, engagement with the Department of Education to do exactly that. Uh, with regard to the, the testing of the travelers to Eastern Cape, and I think it, members must understand that it is not our responsibility as Department of Transport to test people. Um, this is the responsibility of the Department of Health. Um, and I, I think I will answer both Member Said and Member Christians in this regard. Now, the, the, the mission that uh, Member Christian is talking about is not a testing mission, it's a screening mission. Um, but also it, it must be understood, as we are told, that um, while people get screened uh, in various areas, um, but the, the, between 50 and 75% of people are asymptomatic, which means they, they might not present symptoms, but when you test them, they become positive. And obviously we can't do that as Department of Transport. That is not our mandate to test people. What is currently happening is that Everyone who is applying for a permit to travel to, to, to any other province from the Western Cape, um, they apply for these permits in two areas, the magistrate court and the, um, the police stations. And in the police stations in particular, um, I know because I have engaged the, the provincial commissioner, everyone who go to the police station, they are screened. Um, and and then and then before they are issued with the permit. And the issue around fake permits, because I know that this issue has been on the news now. Immediately when I heard about this accusation of the fake permit, I spoke to the provincial commissioner, who spoke to the commissioner um, in the Eastern Cape. Up until today, because um, I was given the impression that there is an investigation that is happening in this regard, um, I've asked the provincial commissioner what are the outcome of that investigation, and up until today, um, she's not aware. She doesn't know. I I'm not saying uh, the, that people are not using fake permit, but I, I haven't seen any evidence that points to that, except to say that there are people um, who go to police station and apply for permits under false pretense. That is, that is true, um, because there are people who pretend you know, to be attending funerals um, and, and then they, they get permits. But also I, I saw this you know, uh, myself, that once the permit holders or the, 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 the drivers, once they get these permits, they then go and load people who have nothing to do with the funeral because they want to make money uh, with the trip that they'll be making from, uh, for example, Western Cape to Eastern Cape. So what we'll be doing, because as part of the uh, hotspot um, um, intervention by the Department of Health, where uh, they'll be targeting specific areas um, because no matter what the announcement uh, from the president will say in terms of levels, there is a plan already in place which will be focusing um, in, on eight areas in, in the metro and also your Cape Winelands, your Overbeck, your Eden. Um, what we'll be doing as Department of Transport, I've already engaged with my officials that um, we must make sure that we, keep, we protect all the areas outside the metro, given the fact that the metro is a hotspot. Um, we'll now be staging these uh, roadblocks, uh, member Christians, and screen people. But we can't test them. We can only screen them. Um, we, will all, we will be working with the Department of Health um, and make sure that those people who are presented with symptoms, they do not travel, so that they can be tested uh, and follow you know, the necessary processes to be quarantined or, I mean, or isolated. That is what we'll be doing now. Um, and But I strongly believe that we need to start um, from the Somerset side and the, 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 the Higuena Tunnel side so that you, 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 you make sure that you protect people outside the metro because metro is the, the, is the area that poses the biggest risk uh, for people who are traveling outside the, the province. So if we can try and stop this here, 
um, I think um, we will be able to minimize the risk. And as I said, minimize the risk because it, the, the fact of the matter is that there are people who are using alternative routes from various areas and they are able um, to bypass uh, roadblocks and get into other provinces. I mean, um, this is happening, you know, across the board. There are people who manage to evade, evade you know, um, 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 law enforcement from other provinces and get here. I mean, um, we just busted people with um, um, uh, with drugs recently, uh, and they've managed to to really, you know, bypass all other provinces. But obviously, we will not blame those provinces. And, and, and accuse them of allowing people to, to bring dra drugs to the Western Cape. We, we understand that it's just not possible for law enforcement to be everywhere. And I think that is how we need to handle this issue because the relationship between these three provinces, Western Cape, Eastern Cape, and Northern Cape is historic. Uh, this is the form, all these provinces are former Cape Colony and therefore um, the relatives are living up in, in these three provinces and they're traveling that is happening. I mean, it's something that is, is something that will be ongoing. Thank you, Chair. Junior Chair, may I pick up the other questions posed to Transport? Yes, please do. Thank you very much. Um, so then, if I may, I'll move on to the questions posed by uh, Member Heron. Yes, the numbers that I indicated were on the basis and only for those people that would need to be supported from a quarantine and isolation perspective from government. So in other words, uh, does not include those that would be able to self-quarantine or self-isolate uh, for, for under their own, uh, either financial terms uh, or obviously in their own homes. Then your question about board community transmission. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a health expert as you well know, so uh, it's probably a, a better question to pose to the Department of Health about at what point do you understand or do you take the that there's broad community transmission taking place? Um, I can hazard my completely uneducated health uh, type of, of view on it, but unfortunately let me rather not try to, to mislead the committee in any way. So I do say it would be better uh, for you to probably provide that particular question, if I may, to you, Chair, to our colleagues from a health perspective. I don't want to uh, give you a wrong impression. Um, then the, the question posed by Honourable Member Christians um, around the, the testing. Absolutely, temperature testing for at public transport interchanges and so on has been considered. The City of Cape Town has apparently already ordered city thermal scanners uh, to start in terms of uh, utilization of their most used interchanges. Um, and as I mentioned in the presentation, certainly Golden Arrow as a company makes sure that their drivers' temperatures are checked uh, each, each time they enter and then exit uh, their depot. Obviously, one must understand potentially the type of costs that are involved. And you mentioned that when you move into on the side of construction side, but uh, for example, based upon our work, because we've been having to look at obviously handout scanners for our teams, if you're looking in the region of about one and a half, 1,400 Rand um, for a handheld scanner. And so if you start to think about the numbers that you need to, to be looking at to deploy potentially uh, across a transport system, they, they could become quite substantial. Um, and that's why I do think that the city is in focusing correctly. So as a starting point in terms of the strategy around the most used uh, interchanges at the moment. Um, your question about the infrastructure aspect, Absolutely. The, the timelines having moved on, as we all know, in the construction game, time is money. If everything becomes more expensive, the longer you, you've got a project uh, on site, additional costs do ramp up with the guarding, additional PPE, etc. Obviously, at this point, we don't have a holistic view of what those sorts of numbers are likely to be. Um, that will only time will tell. But actually the other one, which is a big one for us and we tend to ignore it, is that over the last while we've seen a substantial depreciation in the RAND um, and that that particularly um, within the construction space for certain uh, of the input costs is going to drive the cost up quite dramatically, which is something that we, we mustn't uh, forget. And then I do want to then pick up also, uh, you mentioned the point around the, uh, going back to your remark about 
when people trans transgress the law continuously, we will also obviously make sure that there are communications that go out to the various operators, uh, to drivers and so on, so that they can start to understand the potential ramifications of continued or non-compliance in the space before action is taken. It is important that everybody understands first and then we and then we also move forward with the necessary enforcement measures as Advocate Reinecker mentioned in his input. Chair, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, HRD. Can I just check, uh, were all members' questions answered? Okay. Um, we have about 30 minutes left uh, of the meeting, and we also do have some committee admin um, that we do need to take care of. Um, so I think we might have time to squeeze in one final um, round of questions, um, mm -hmm. if there are any, um, as Thank usual. You. Are you raising a point of order, Honourable Dagmore? No, not at all, Chair. Just um, a request to ask a few questions. OK, well, let me get to that. Um, we're going to then have, we've had uh, almost two hours of questions already. So welcome to the meeting, Honourable Dagmore. Um, I'm going to start with the DA. There's one minute for questions. Um, thank you, Chair. Chair, if I may, um, uh, with regards to municipalities and their readiness, um, to issue driver's licenses and um, and um, expired actual um, car discs. Um, in the past, there has been a, 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 a normally a, a long queue to access these services um, in various municipalities across the province. Is there any particular um, assistance being provided from the department to make sure that municipalities are able to address um, the backlog um, um, in in this upcoming um, once once it's able to thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Mitchell. I then recognise the ANC. Thank you, <clears throat> and thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to ask um, MEC Simmers um, if he could indicate to us um, which social housing projects. Um, have been implemented over the last 10 years in the inner city of Cape Town and of all our various municipalities. And here I'm referring to the inner city of George or Neisner or Plettenberg Bay um, and the, the different municipalities. If you could just indicate to me over the last 10 years um, which projects um, have been implemented to completion. And then if you could also indicate to us which proposed inner city projects which are aimed at reversing apartheid spatial planning um, are um, in the pipeline? Are your questions related to the presentation and COVID matters? Because if not, I would uh, ask that you pose those questions in the relevant um, committee and or um, through parliamentary questions. But, you know, with all due respect, Chair, I heard the MEC Simmers talking about a number of projects which are only due to start in June. So once again, you know, right at the beginning, we asked for an opposition leader to chair this because what the chair is now demonstrating is absolute bias and it's really quite shocking. Oh, come so I would on, like to ask my more, question. Please, I, I would like my question this. to be answered because okay. you right. allow other questions and chair, on a point of order. order. Yeah, Honorable Mitchell, your point of order. Thank you very much, um, Honourable Chair. Chair, I think that it's it's as disingenuous of Honourable Dugmore to to join this committee nearly two hours later to then have one to have carte blanche on on what kind of questions he he, he wants to, to to pose to the relevant departments. There has been a presentation which Honourable Dugmore was not a uh, present for, can we please stick to the presentations delivered by the relevant departments and then allow the departments to answer? There is other <coughs> parliamentary processes and avenues that Honourable Dagmore can use and, at, and is at his disposal to, to get these questions answered. Chairperson, could I address you? Um, please proceed. Um, thank you. Um, if your ruling is that my question is not allowed, I would like to ask the following question to MEC Simmers. If you could indicate to me specifically what support has been provided during the COVID-19 period to contractors at all levels um, who've obviously been impacted upon 
um, by the um, inability to actually do physical construction. And if you could also just indicate that in regard to his understanding, and maybe the MEC Madi Gizela could help, that in regard to public works construction and buildings, such as schools and hospitals and so on, um, whether any of that construction is has started or is due to start. Thank you. Thank you. I recognise um, the good party. Um, no, I'm fine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Then recognise the ACDP. Uh, Chairperson, uh, thank you. Please. Apologies, Honourable Christians. I'm just waiting for Honourable Dugmore to turn off his camera. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Please. Thank you, Chairperson. I just want to uh, just just one question is um, uh, when it came to I think it's uh, human settlements. Um, it, it was said that uh, there is, uh, you know, if you look at informal settlements, uh, Overstrand, Neisner, Tewakaskloof is the um, the areas that you have these um, uh, informal settlements um, springing up. Um, and we we spoke about the moratorium. What I just want to know, and I know, um, uh, you know, is the department speaking to the municipalities when it comes to um, now in the level five? Did, did, so what I'm actually asking, was there um, added people uh, added to these um, informal settlements in the level five and the level four? Did they pick that up? And how are they going to deal with social distancing in, in, in especially in people just coming in? And how, how are they going to manage of that um, social distancing and all the other things that we need to uh, adhere to. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Christians. Just to check uh, the EFF or the Freedom Front on the line, would they like to pose a question? Uh, I don't think they are. Um, well, I'll then hand over to um, the Department no, sorry, of Human Settlements. Sorry, point of order, Chair, point of order. Yes, Honourable uh, Dudmore. Um, Chair, I know it's 20 to 4. Um, you did indicate that the committee needs time also for administration, but could you just um, consider a request to ask another question? Because I noted that some other parties didn't utilize their time. Um, we're actually in our third round of questions um, as a result of that. So I would invite you to pose your questions in writing um, as per usual. Um, and we're going to move on to the answers. I then ask the Department of Human Settlements to please respond to the questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for a few interesting questions. I'm just doing it with a smile. Let me first uh, start with Member Christians from the OCDP. Firstly, Member Christians, during lockdown alert level five and even during lockdown alert level four up until a week ago, no people could move in between areas, even in informal settlements. And if that happened, Clearly, the police failed to enforce the lockdown regulations. So I think that's my response to your answer. Member Dagmar, I'll answer your question pertaining to assistance to contractors uh, during this period. And your second question was construction recommencement. The first part of your question was that um, as a department, we have appointed the service provider to assist our contractors to develop the occupational health and safety plans to ensure that the adherence to COVID-19 protocols. Obviously, our bigger contractors have appointed themselves occupational health and safety agents, and their, their core focus will be to assist smaller contractors and municipalities who do not have the capacity. And uh, unfortunately, you arrived two hours late because I have visited uh, certain of our specific sites to see that this is actually happening on site, uh, Member Dagmore. Your second question pertaining to construction recommencement. Uh, uh, most of our, our contractors and subcontractors have systematically started re recommencing, going on to site, obviously ensuring that they do adhere to COVID-19 protocols over the last seven days. So it will be picking up next week, uh, but uh, the core focus will be during, uh, uh, since being back on site in Bedarkmoor, to actually look at those units which we were supposed to hand over before the the lockdown regulations prohibited that, and to ensure that those units will be ready for handover by or on before the 7th of June. Our estimates are as per after visiting certain sites and also working through our data that we received 
from these contractors and our regional managers is that we're looking in excess of 1,300 units across the province that will be ready for handover before or on the 7th of June. Thank you. May I add to that, please? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Just to add to what uh, Minister Sim has indicated, so obviously the um, opening of our construction sites also creates economic opportunities. So there is some relief or economic relief for that sector. So that's also an added benefit of opening our construction sites. Thank you. Thank you. Any further uh, inputs from human settlements? If not, we'll then move on to transport and public works. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the question was really the there were two. The one which is around the licenses uh, and the approach and the readiness from the municipality side. So certainly our department has been involved in a number of meetings with the Road Traffic Management Corporation. And as per requirement from them, we submitted today a risk assessment document in relation to the reopening of the vehicle testing centers, the driver's license centers, vehicle licensing, and so on. Um, and because we are, as I'm sure what you, you're getting to, concerned about the readiness in terms of social distancing um, and all the necessary potential risks that, that may come from there, we are therefore, based upon that risk assessment, uh, getting some guidance from the RTMC including understanding that they intend to, from what I've understood, phase in certain functions uh, in terms of operation and also looking to ensure that certain of the transactions can actually be processed online. Um, and they are trying to then do that in order to also limit the, the need for people to present themselves physically and therefore also reduce the types of queues that you're referring to. Obviously, that, that is something that is potentially relatively easy to do and to run uh, within an urban setup, potentially less so in a rural context where the kind of connectivity and approach is not necessarily there. But we are working with the municipalities to try to understand what may be required and what support we need to give them. So uh, definitely we are trying to work hand in hand with them uh, in that regard. Then on the uh, question about, uh, through you Chair, back to uh, member Dugmore, it was contained in our presentation in terms of the projects that uh, have got back onto site, that can get back onto site, obviously some of them more ready than others, given the requirements as was, it was indicated from an operational health and safety perspective. Contractors do need to ensure that they comply with the health and safety requirements in terms of various plans, the PPE and others. Um, all of our roads projects are back and then slowly but surely a number of the public works ones are also returning to some, but it was also contained in the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, are there any concluding remarks from either of the ministers, please? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may be brief from my, my side, and I think listening to all the questions from the members to, to, to both my department and I think to Mr. Medikizelas as well, um, it's crystal clear that we, when we start focusing on post-COVID-19 uh, governance structures now, we approach governance, we need to look at firstly the way that the budgetary models work and our budgets are allocated from a national perspective to provinces, because I do believe it needs to be aligned to this new norm, but more so towards those provinces which has been flagged during this whole COVID-19 program. And I'm focusing on my own uh, department, also the role of human settlements and its role within this new post-COVID-19 governance structure. Thank you. Chair, um, uh, let me first take the opportunity and uh, thank you um, for, for treating us so well and with respect and your chairing has been um, very, very good. Uh, and also thank all the members of this committee for asking, you know, um, relevant questions. Uh, this is what we expect um, to, to be held accountable. And uh, the last thing I want to say from my side is that we, we have seen that the, 
the spread of COVID-19 is now starting to pick up. Uh, we've been warned uh, for some time now by the scientists and the epidemiologists. Um, and we know that the numbers that um, we are seeing, as alarming as they might be, I mean, um, they are still too low um, compared to what we've been told. So um, the multi-pronged approach that we have taken as Department of Transport and Public Works, working with the Department of Health and Municipalities, is going to be crucial going forward. And we will really um, expect all the members uh, of this ad hoc committee to work with us, because as the HOT said, um, um, we have enough <clears throat> um, you know, facilities that we own as government in various areas where the hotspots are, uh, and I think um, given the, the, the budget constraint, as Minister Sima has said, um, we can find a way um, to really utilize them um, um, so that we can be able to deal with the challenge of quarantine and isolation sites, but at the same time uh, do those you know, within the, the available resources. And we will need, really need all the community leaders, uh, the members of all the political parties, uh, to work together and we expect to be held accountable. Uh, and of course, things are not perfect. This is something new to all of us. Uh, but I want to thank you very much uh, and all the members for really, you know, um, engaging us um, um, with respect. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ministers, for those concluding remarks. I'd like to thank you uh, both again, as well as your HODs and your teams, for having presented the information that the committee requested, as well as for answering our questions and for your time today. We wish you all um, very well in the weeks, uh, the very difficult weeks that lie ahead. Um, and um, yeah, we, um, we will certainly um, be engaging with you again in the future. I'd also like to thank uh, the PMG as well as members of the media and the public that have followed this meeting. Um, the formal part of the meeting now concludes. Um, uh, if uh, committee members then could stay behind so that we can look at some committee administration. Thank you very much to the departments. You're all excused. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as usual, I would invite members to please send any requests for information or resolutions to the procedural officers for today's meeting by Monday, the 25th of May. Um, we will then look at two sets of minutes. The first is the 13th of May. Um, it's now on the screen. I hope everyone can see it. Um, we'll just have a look uh, that your name is correctly captured under attendance. Any edits or amendments to page one? Then moving on to page two. Page three. Right. Um, any edits or amendments? So may we proceed to adopt? Deirdre Bartman, I move to adopt. Thank you, Honorable Bartman. Second lecture. Gillian uh, Bosman. Thank you, Honorable Bosman. Um, then um, I believe we also have the minutes of the 15th of May. Could I just uh, understand from um, Ms. Klitter, are we able to have a look at the minutes of the 15th of May? Chairperson, good day, members. Um, we plan to adopt it on Friday, but it's ready. So if members want to adopt it, adopt it today, um, we can do this as well. OK, I think if we can beam them up and we'll just go through them very slowly. Sorry, Chairperson, it's Brett Heron. Yes, Honourable Heron. Oh, I don't know what you mean by beam it up. <laughs> um, <Okay>. but <laughs> are we, I mean, are you, because I'm not seeing it on my screen. Oh, there it goes, thanks. 
OK, all right. Can everyone else see it? Anybody yes, that can't see clear. it? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, so attendance, page one. Then moving on to page two. Chairperson, I can't see the bottom of page two of page one. If you can just okay. double check that, please. Just go up a little bit. There we go. Stop. That's fine. Thank you, Mappy. Right, thank you. Um, sorry, Chairperson. Yes. Um, I also don't see my name as present, and I was present at that meeting on the 15th. Right, so I, I don't know if I just can't see it on the page or if I'm just not there. Let's double check. Can we go up? Just make sure that uh, Honourable Heron is uh, captured as attending. No? Well spotted. Um, we'll, right. we'll add it. We'll add it to the minutes, Chairperson. Okay. OK, and then if we can go down to page two. OK, moving on to page three. OK, if we could stop there just for a moment. Okay, please continue to point number three. Okay, let's proceed to page four. Is everyone happy? Can we then adopt the minutes um, uh, with the correction of the attendance and include Honourable Heron? Move to adopt with correction, Chairperson, dear Bartman. Thank you, Honourable Bartman. Do I have a seconder, please? Great, Heron. Thank you, Honourable Heron. Um, uh, as you'll note, there were two um, questions and resolutions that were forwarded to the procedural officers uh, following that meeting. The one was from Honourable Heron, which was the presentation on the economic recovery plan, which has now been captured in the minutes as a resolution. And the second was from Honourable Bosman. Um, he sent a letter to myself asking that the um, individuals that were mentioned in the meeting that were having trouble with the UIF that their query be uh, resolved. So that letter has then been or will be forwarded to the Department of Labor for their assistance. No further questions and or resolutions were received from that meeting. OK, um, our next meeting then is on the 22nd of May, uh, which is this Friday. The theme is government finance and budgets and corporate governance. So we will be receiving presentations from the um, Treasury and Minister of Finance, as well as then from the Premier and Department uh, of the Premier. Um, are there any um, other uh, matters under general? Uh, Chairperson, may I, may I speak? It's Brett yes, Heron. Honourable Heron. Um, it was a, a meeting a week ago when I raised with you um, a question about the procedure if um, I believe we were the committee was misled by a presentation. And you were going to take advice and get back to us on how I should handle that. Okay. Um, I um, so I must apologise. I haven't received uh, any advice uh, at the moment. Um, may I send that to you in writing before our next meeting? That's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anything else under general? 
None. All right. Thanks very much, members, for your um, questions and for your participation in this meeting. We will then see you on Friday at two o'clock. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yeah.